<laughs> All right, good. Okay. Welcome to Fruiting Body Podcast with your host, Brendan O'Neill. Today we have an amazing guest. This is Tony Mishlaev, or on Instagram, Tones of Blue. Um, he's a underwater photographer, and we're going to dive deep into that, no pun intended, and understand his whole story. Uh, so before we get started, kick that intro, Talise. <laughs> Tony, thanks for joining us today. Again, I always tell my guests, I don't know where this voice comes from. It's like when the camera turns on, you turn into this like radio personnel. This isn't me. It will fade away in about a couple minutes, but uh, <laughs> okay. it is what it is. Um, so thanks for joining us today. Usually on the, and I didn't, we didn't do too much prep because we're starting a bit early today at 10 a.m. Um, but the idea of the Fruiting Body podcast is we're connecting with people on the island to kind of share their stories with either people that used to live here, they're coming to Phuket or Thailand, or um, just of general interest. And the way the structure will start with is we want to understand your story and connect that to your craft and your profession and how that all came together. So let's start right from the beginning and go right back to your childhood and we'll, we'll skim through it pretty quick. Um, we were talking a little bit, your, your father is of Slavic descent and he came directly over and you were involved in gymnastics from a young kid so let's start there and we'll we'll take it from there yeah so uh, i was born in odessa ukraine and we moved to canada when i was six my dad was a gymnastics coach um i don't know exactly what year he started however we he he, he kind of pushed me into it a little bit you know as a kid you don't really know what you want i was still in kindergarten at the time and then he took me to a competitive level at but like when we were in Canada I was still doing it and I think uh it kind of was a little overwhelming for me as a kid you know to just be competing when I didn't didn't really want to get into it but it it gave me a lot of good um lessons for life gave me really good dexterity good muscle memory so it's easy for me to stay in shape and I really am grateful for it now even though at the time I was I was not so happy about that and then uh, I started skateboarding and then skateboarded for 15 years and then decided to travel and made my way to Thailand. One thing about living in Canada was that you couldn't really go in the ocean. Like, like you can, but you can't really stay in there. It's not that clear. And it's, it's a bit cold. and It's a bit cold. <laughs> a bit. A little bit. <laughs> yeah. yeah I, I don't like being cold at all. So I, I had plans to travel. And it was going to be a six-month trip. And uh, it ended up... So you were, and, and anyone can go on YouTube and you can look up Tony. I, there's a bunch of skate videos. So I was doing my <laughs> research and I honestly, we were talking about that. I didn't even click on it. I'm like, there's no way this is him too. <laughs> yeah. I just thought, you know, it's, it's maybe a more popular name. And uh, I moved on from, from that. So your gymnastics, I'm assuming this would bring structure and discipline into uh, your, your life. How did you apply that into skateboarding besides like the dexterity? Was it more just like... The, the never give up discipline. And uh, this is more of a discussion. It's not really a long-winded question, but it's, I was a skateboarder as well. And there's a certain point, like, I was okay. I could get up to, like, maybe I could do eight stairs at the skate park. I was ripping through bowls. I was clearing garbage cans. I could throw it like a melon grab. But there's a certain point, like, where I, there's a line I wouldn't cross. Meaning, like, I'm not going to go down a 10 stair and try to lip slide over rail. No. Right. But on, in your case, like when you're going to that like amateur professional level of skateboarding, I mean, you're going to fuck up and you're going to get fucked up. Yeah. So <laughs> your discipline from the gymnastics, like does did that really help with the skateboarding to allow you to push through as well? And, you know, really focus on some of those tricks that are, you know, you could end up crashing 10, 20 times before you land it. Yeah, that's a good question. I, I mean, I think I, ne I didn't think about it because when if you grow up from a very young age and all you know is like repetition and discipline, then even when I did step away from gymnastics and started skateboarding, I think I didn't realize that I had more like better discretional effort than some people. You know, I, I'm, I wasn't like the best skateboarder out there, but I think discretional effort was like the key to that is just what is your standard for a job well done. 
and yeah i i don't, I don't really know like i was just going based on feeling you know but I, what about like the fear and because i'm assuming in gymnastics there's you probably face a lot of pain as well going through the motions and and and, and trying to get to that next level but the same can be applied in skateboarding i mean crashing falling i mean i'm assuming you've probably broke something in your life skateboarding um i've broken my wrist once yeah, yeah i was trying to feeble like uh like i was trying to grind like a 12 stair rail or something and it like didn't lock in slipped out didn't want to get sacked like didn't want to fall on my nuts so like yeah. held it very long slipped back and then put my hand down and then like my whole body landed on my wrist and then it broke Aside from that, no, I've been very lucky, but also I'm I'm quite a tall guy and I weigh a, quite a bit. Like, you know, most most good skaters, they tend to be like not quite as big, you mm -hmm. know, like proportionately it it's better to weigh less and be slightly smaller. So, I wouldn't often go big. Like I prefer to jump high and like do ledges that were very tall because mm -hmm. I have strong legs. So, you know, or just be creative and quick-footed where you do things that require you to be innovative, you know. So just trying to stand out in different ways, which kind of goes for freediving photography. At the yeah, and, as well. and this creative process, and especially because uh, street skateboarding, it is an art as well. Um, I, I did it from about age, I'm going to say eight or nine till about 18. But I mean, those summers when you're a kid in grade, whatever, grade... Uh, pretty much six through 10, that was your summer all day, eight hours a day, skateboarding and, you know, going around your town or your city and, and trying to get creative and find different, you know, shopping malls or ledges and, and just in general places in your city where you can skate on and, and, and thinking of, okay, what can we do here? How can we, you know, take advantage of this? Did that, was that kind of your style as well when you were skating and growing up, the street oh, style? For sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, like I apply that to how I, take my photographs yeah. now to this day like if it wasn't for the skateboarding i probably wouldn't have like the perspective of searching for locations like i do which has given me a very unique advantage in, in what i do now and yeah as a kid like i spent i don't know how many like how many thousands of hours just rolling around industrial areas like yeah dirty dirty areas just looking for ways to use you know architecture were, were you in the city of vancouver like directly or which part of the city i was in richmond just south mm -hmm. so uh just a little suburban city to the south across a bridge have you heard of it i've heard of i've heard of richmond but what, what was it like growing up there is it is it a safer na neighborhood is is this getting closer to surrey it's not <laughs> it's not <laughs> this is surrey is uh surrey has always been kind of poked at for being yeah. a, bit, a bit ghetto which it, it, it isn't really but like it is fun to just kind of tease yeah. on the neighboring cities yeah um but uh no richmond was like very safe and sheltered i think a lot of wealth and a lot of immigrants um with money have settled there so it was good aside from you know like you know, like the the kids in high school who who watch like the gangster movies and and just try to like yeah. pretend like they had a hard life. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think how old are you now? You're thirty two. Okay, I'm thirty five. So it's kind of the same way growing up. You know, uh, hip hop was a big influence then, and everyone thought they were a gangster. Yeah, but they're yeah. from you know a town of where I was was maybe fifty sixty thousand, and you know they're you know flashing gun signs and pretending they're a rapper yeah yeah and just like and just like and their parents are like dropping them off at school yeah it's yeah, like yeah. What, what the hell are you doing yeah. <laughs> that, that 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 was definitely like the, the style i grew up in but we had the skate parks which kind of took us out of that as well yeah meaning like when i first was in i was from a, a, a suburb outside of hamilton called waterdown and we didn't have skate parks until i was about 16 or 17 and then finally we used to just build them yeah because the town was developing so what we would do is we would go to the construction sites and steal the lumber and build half pipes yeah and then yeah. the construction workers would come out rip it apart take it all back from us and then we got a little more creative and we would take the half pipe material and like go way deep into the forest and build a half pipe there yeah but they would figure it out and they come and take the lumber back but yeah growing up in, in canada skating was a huge part of, of my life as well because there's not really much else to do no, so yeah. your mom would kind of just drop you off in the, 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 the main area of the of the town for the day and you just rip around for eight hours. 
Yeah. So um, to, to jump ahead, I, I did a little bit of research on your side and you initially started in fashion photography, if I'm correct. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. Yeah. Skateboarding photography. And then I took a program, a photography program, and then I fell in love with like environmental portraiture and fashion. And so that that's how I, I was assuming to connect it, because in the skating industry, fashion's a big part of it as well. Is that how that kind of came together initially or how did you get into fashion and photography? I, I, I'm kind of like a tunnel vision guy, so I wasn't really like too concerned with my appearance when I skateboarded, aside from what like sponsors gave me or whatever I just bought. The The way it tied in for me more than anything is like if you if you like look at skateboard photography, it's a person in an environment, right? Like the environment is a very important part of the image. You know, like if you don't show the spot and you just like show, just crop in on a person, which is what all portrait photographers do when they try and shoot skateboarding. And you're like, dude, like my board's like half cropped out of the photo. What are you doing? Mm. Um, then, then like taking that idea of environment, it's called environmental portraiture when you're using a wide angle lens or you're showing a big scene with a person in it. Like that's like the technical term. And that really, when I started doing fashion and kind of fell in love with that side of it, I realized like I don't like doing too many crops where you like cut the body and everything. I still enjoyed putting the environment, even when it wasn't like architectural or related to skateboarding. It was like a scene in a forest or in a city or something like that. So like that just kind of stuck with me and I just tried to go in that direction. But after the program, I abandoned it like because I went to travel. So I didn't really have access to models. Mm -hmm. So I just kind of tried to do travel photography. And then how, how, like what, what was your, your, um, before, well, before I jump into that, I, as a skateboarder myself at the time, I, if you remember when I, back in this time, um, you had movies like CKY and Bam Margera. This kind of <laughs> influenced a lot of people bringing out their camcorders. Not, not so much for, you know, the pranks and the stunts, but more like filming. And we would go around with these, uh, I don't even, you know, they had the little, little tapes. These yeah, little tapes. The, the mini DVD. Yeah, the mini yeah. DVD. Ours weren't even DVDs, like physical tapes. Yeah, me, I think they're called mini DVs, if I'm not DVD, mistaken. Yeah, yeah I, yeah, I know the ones. You're and that's kind of, yeah. so I, I didn't have, and I'm not a photographer or anything like that, but that's where the, uh, what, what we were doing at that point in time and trying to, you know, capture the moments with with this photography the problem was nobody had the ability to edit it after so there were just these long drawn out yeah. videos how, is that how you initially got into photography or how like when did you first grab the camera and find the passion for that yeah good question um well yeah i mean w we did video and in the beginning it was like recording from the mini dv tapes yeah. to a vhs and then just like stopping and recording at the right time you plug in whatever the what do you call the three cables? I don't even remember. Uh, the, the red, blue, and the AV? red, white. AV. AV. Yeah, AV. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry. Yeah, AV. I, yeah, I yeah. should know this. Um, yeah. But yeah, red, the red, white, and yellow That's ones. The one. And then, yeah, so I made like a little sponsor tape when I was 12 years old. I wish I could get my hands on it again. It, it would be amazing. But we'll we'll put that out there to the universe. No, we'll find <laughs> find that sponsor day. I'm the only one that wants to see it oh, again. Okay, I don't, okay. don't want to make it public. It's, okay. it's hilarious. But if somebody I'm has it. Somebody does have it, but it's being held ransom, kind of. Oh. No, no, half ransom. Like, oh, okay, uh, okay. I could okay. probably weasel it out. Okay, okay. But, yeah. I don't know how he got his hands on it either. But, so, um, yeah. So, and then in high school, I took a photography program <laughs> and a video program, and I failed that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, that definitely wasn't, like, the start of my passion. But I think it was just so linear, and it was like, you got to learn this, you got to learn that. And I didn't really understand why. Like, I was like, how am I going to apply this to what I like? And it just didn't make, make sense to me. I'm like, we're already making videos. I don't get it. And this is in high school, so you, you, you kind of first picked up that camera. You've, you've made your, uh, your demo tape or your demo reel. Yeah. And, and kind of, you know, Bob's your uncle. It stemmed off from there. Yeah, I mean, a after that, like, you know, as I got better at skateboarding, I, I met more talented videographers and stopped doing yeah. it myself and realized that's not my place. And then as I was, like, in my early 20s, I met a really talented skateboard photographer named Curtis Rothney, and he encouraged me to buy a camera He's like just do it just like just go buy a camera i'm like well, i don't know which one like there's so many models and he recommended some and i was like okay 
And I just decided, like, I'm going to buy it. What, what was that first camera? Uh, Nikon D300. Nikon D3. So yeah. it's still, in the, it's at that point, it's probably not a cheap camera at that time either. Uh, I think I bought it used for 800 US or Canadian, sorry. Yeah, I'm pretty sure 800 Canadian with just like a 50 millimeter 1.8. Mm-hmm. And just like from the day one, I was like, I'm only doing manual settings. And I had no idea what that even meant. And just like went out to a park and just clicked anything I could and just tried to make it as intuitive as possible right away. Did you have, a, like, a direction in mind for your style, or were you kind of learning it along the way? Oh, no, I had no, like, I was like, I'm going to shoot skateboarding, okay. you know, that's all I knew. Uh, and then I spent about a year and a half, two years, um, just kind of looking up as much as I could, like, researching as much as I could on my own. But um, eventually I felt like I hit a bit of a plateau, like, I didn't really know where to go, like, I kind of felt it out as much as I could, and... I decided to take a program. Okay. Yeah. And and for the younger generation, they should understand that, like, at that point in time to find information, I mean, YouTube probably wasn't even that, there probably wasn't that much out there. How were you trying to educate yourself? Oh, yeah, there was no YouTube. Like, I, I there was no tutorials for yeah, stuff like that. Exactly. It, it was all forums and skateboard photographers, uh, they have a tendency to be, like, very critical and, like, very high standard and... They appeal to, like, traditional photography um, techniques. Like, they really focus on composition and um, lighting. And these are things that, like, it's such a critical culture. Like, everybody talks shit about each other, right? And so you kind of, like, feel like, oh, okay, I got it. I got to Like, I'm walking well, on It's a bit of a boys' club, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, like, they're not very welcoming because, like, photographers, you know, have their own crew that they photograph. So... It's, it's hard to break through. I don't think I really broke through in skateboard photography, but it was interesting to just adopt that mentality of like, you know, like you need to get it as good as you can, which I was not. But at the time, it was more of like the state of mind that it gave me so that when I started the photography program, I just kind of, I just put in like, hundred percent and where, where was this program was it online was it in vancouver it was in vancouver it was um it's langara college it was their photography program and it was incredible i did it for two years and the 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 teachers were amazing i was going depending on the semester i was doing three days a week uh and then four days a week at most which was three hours after work so i'd work like full time and then i'd go from six thirty to nine thirty p.m and do it but i would come in as early as i could and i'd stay as late as i could and like yeah i was just really really ambitious at that point to become a photographer yeah i mean and that's a lot to balance to working and and going to school i mean you have to be quite passionate and dedicated to to have that patience and stay focused where where were you working at that time oh man yeah (laughs) Uh, i was working at uh fedex in customer service yeah and they and they actually funded my whole entire education that's amazing. Yeah. Why why would they take that decision? Did they have um, like a program in place for you guys? Oh yeah, or? so that like for their for their um uh staff for their employees, they have incredible benefits. So I was working more than 30 hours a week. Yeah. I was just saving up to travel. The like at the same time as choosing to do the photography program, I really wanted to travel. So I was like I'm not compromising anything. I'm just going to work every day and I'm going to learn every day as much as I could. So Every Sunday as well, the school get, gave you the option to do a three-hour photo shoot in the studio with all their gear. And, you know, they have the fancy stuff, like all pro photo. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so I tried to go every Sunday if I could. So uh, what was your, your, your plan and your goal at this time? You're, you're doing the program. You're, go, you're, you're working. You're saving up to travel. At, at what age are you around, like 20, 21, 22? Yeah, I think like 22, 23. And then what was the plan? You want to travel, but where, how long? What what was the uh, the intention of traveling? Yeah, I, I think it was like before the term FOMO was invented. I think I just had FOMO because I was going through a really hard time before I made that decision. I was like in a, in a relationship and it just wasn't, uh, it was just kind of like draining my funds. And I was like living downtown Vancouver and it was not, um, not quite downtown, sorry, just outside of downtown, but it was, uh, it was like all me trying to support the whole thing and it just put me in a bad place. And then actually <laughs> one day I took mushrooms 
and uh, right. when I was like going <clears throat> through a through a hard time, which is a weird time to to take mushrooms. Can I talk about that? Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah ab- ab- oh. absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, yeah. This is a this mushroom, is, this podcast. Is a mushroom <laughs> podcast. Yeah, I know. I just, I, I, I know, I know you're you're doing the mushroom thing. Yeah. I'm just not sure. But we're, we're doing. We're, so what we're doing is, um, I won't go into detail, but we'll be doing like medicinal mushrooms, like lion's mane and, and reishi. And this gotcha. is becoming huge on the islands in yeah. Vancouver. I have yeah, a buddy yeah, there yeah. now. He runs a. Uh, shout out Brett if you're watching this. He started a a, psych, a psilocybin therapeutic podcast on the island, and it's wow. growing. But I'll, I'll share that later. So cool. Yeah. yeah. So you you're going through this rough time, <laughs> and you you decided to do to do psilocybin yeah. magic mushrooms, right? Which but, is rare for me. Which is, mm. and it's also people should know. And and again, I I don't know why this is going to connect to to you with diving, but you should not do mushrooms when the sea is rough. Oh yeah. This is like 101 like it's it's for example like oh, I guess should you go free diving when it's a storm and there's a wave? No, but you know now that you say that it actually does affect my mood a lot like cuz I see the ocean from my house and it's like when it's stormy it it does have an impact on yeah. my day. It's interesting. Yeah, I didn't think about that because at that time I was not yet connected to the water as I am now. Mm-hmm. So yeah, so so just to go back to that, yeah. it was um, it was uh, it was just like this night. It was a Sunday night. I had a full week of work ahead of me. It was like eleven p.m. Like you know, the worst time to take <laughs> mushrooms. Ever. Yeah, that's way too late at night. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Yeah. And for whatever reason, I was just like, I don't know. I'm like, I don't know. This is like a hopeless situation. We had just finally, I just broken up with her, and I was like still bummed. And I, I took them, and it just like I was lying on the floor in my room. And I was by myself. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's weird. okay. That's no, that's normal. Yeah, no, but like it's just funny because that's not how most experiences go for me, and I d- I rarely take them. Was like, it your yeah. first time doing it? No. Okay, it, so you're you're comfortable then? Yeah, no, it it like once every three or four years, yeah. maybe like a mild dose, but I I really don't don't dabble yeah, in that so much but how much do you think you took at that time like three grams and it's really strong yeah (laughs) okay (laughs) so it's 11 p.m you're you're not going to bed till at least six at this point i'm working at like 11 and uh and so yeah sorry fedex (laughs) it's this thing anyways it's all decriminalized it's it's legalized past anyways yeah 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 oh yeah no and i mean i still showed up for work and did a good job so how how did that did you learn anything from that so 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 this was a very pivotal moment in my life actually like i i don't really like say that everybody should do it but for whatever reason that night it hit me hard and i was just thinking like you know you kind of cut through the excuses like you can just see what you want and like everything else you can just kind of shuffle out of the way like my friends had just finished traveling and that's where the fomo thing came in they had just come back from asia they had done the whole southeast asia circuit and it was uh it was incredible like the stories they had to tell and they're very good storytellers so i was like i like this sounds so good like i really i really want to do it and uh i just felt like i had no money no time and and then that night i was like i want to travel it's like well just work your job like save more money stop spending more money work more like figure this out and i forget what plan i made i think yeah i moved back in with my parents to actually save up more more, yeah yeah yeah. because i was like i'm leaving like and uh i don't want to be here like i'm not going to be skating that much longer at that point, I was thinking, like, okay, like, it's hurting my knees. You know, I'm, like, a tall dude. I, I can't yeah. jump down stuff forever. Like, I got to think about something else. And the same time, I was like, you love photography. Like, why aren't you in a program? Like, why aren't you doing it? I'm like, I'm going to take, like, a formal program. And it was all that night. I just, like, felt it. And I woke up with the same feeling. And it never left. And for two years, actually, I saved up. I saved up a lot and uh studied a lot and then just tried to learn as much as i could in the beginning it was definitely like a few steps back learning formal photography and just kind of like recalibrating how i see it and well that, that's yeah. the um I'm, I'm gonna look this up and, and shout them out because uh, i feel bad now but i was talking with brett the other day about psychedelic uh or psilocybin experiences um and i'll pull that out so people can check it out. It's really cool. Daily, I think it's called what? Daily Mushroom something. I don't know. 
Because this all connects. Daily. Yeah, it's called Instagram Daily Mushroom dot co. Uh, actually, I used to go to high school with this this guy. He, he lives on the island. Yeah. Um, and they're they're just starting kind of a. It's more of an informative. It's a podcast, but uh, audio at the at this moment. I think they're starting to do pretty basic mm. like, um, um, video maybe webcam stuff. But it's mostly a, they're speaking with people in the industry, like in maps and also involved in uh, like therapeutic use and bringing these people on. But to jump back to your point, I had this discussion with him on the weekend and, and it's exactly what you said. When you take psilocybin and, and especially if you do it on yourself in the right set and setting and you're not doing it with the intention for let's have a laugh and let's make this recreational kind of at the end of the day, what it will do, it just provides clarity. Yeah. It it's provides weird. clarity, yeah, and right. I find, like, what it does for me, and I won't do it often, like, I'll do it every three or four months, but if, if it's if I feel I need to do it. What I personally feel it does is people get stuck, I don't want to say in a negative mind loop, but in a routine that they want to break out of. Mm -hmm. And usually it could be something as stupid as, okay, I want to wake up at 6 a.m., but then you keep waking up at 7 a.m., Okay, I should go to the gym at lunch. And then you go eat something bad. Okay, I want to at night meditate. I want to read this book. And like you have all these ideas of your life of what you want to do, of, of a daily routine. Mm -hmm. But then it's easily to fall into a comforting routine, which is, you know, the simple things. Yeah. And sometimes you, you have this mentality. And I know for me, if I want to break out of that, I could do a psychedelic or a psilocybin um, trip. And I'll only do it by myself. And I'll do it in my bed. And I'll do like, it's called the Terrence McKenna hero dose. And I'll do like five grams. Oh, wow. Yeah. I know I, Terrence McKenna. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll do this stuff. Like I'll, I'll turn on the air con. I like to do it at like 1 PM so yeah. that it's done at five or it's, six. Yeah, and then I can, I can better. have dinner and go to bed and I'll come out of it with like so clear. But the reality was you always knew what you had to do anyways. For some reason, it just kicks you in the ass. Yeah. It's one thing to logically know what you need to do. And it's another thing to feel what you need to do. Yeah kind of go into like a more of like in like somehow like program it into your subconscious and i find um positive reaffirmation i don't know if you know this yep. technique this is like very useful for stuff like that i is really it, i really like is it, it more what do you uh, i'm not familiar familiar with that term do you mean kind of just telling yourself like using positive vocabulary instead of putting yourself down or yeah you know well yeah yeah so you would you it's better to record your own voice and to tell yourself exactly in positive words what it is you want to achieve or what it is you want to, like, how you want to spend the day or focus or anything like yeah. that. So for free diving, I do it a lot. Like, if I have, if I'm doing a very deep dive, well, not a very deep dive, I've never been very deep, but, you know, a deep dive for me, you know, like, uh, it's possible you might break out of your relaxation. You don't want to freak out down there. And uh, giving yourself, like, that, um, giving yourself a message like a literally an audio message where you use positive words so you don't say don't panic you say you stay relaxed yeah you stay relaxed because you need to give yourself these kinds of words um but you you, you just want to craft like a very direct very um straightforward message about what it is you want and then you listen back to it and especially how you're formulating that sentence uh, instead of it being like, again, don't panic. It's you're reformulating it to positive words. Yeah, exactly. So it doesn't allow you to go into this ma negative mindset yeah, as well. Su super important. Mm -hmm. um, like going back to mushrooms, I, I think like there's so much value in uh, if, if somebody's taking it with the right, with the right, you know. Yeah, with the right uh, agenda. <laughs> Agenda, I think, yeah. yeah, set. They say set setting and, and intention. Yeah, is intention very, is very important. Exactly. Um, and and also, yeah, just being like set up so you know how how to experience and how to handle it. But um, unless you're an avid user and you've probably, if you haven't done it like four or five times, like it's very difficult to say I'm in control on the first time because you're not really gonna know yeah. what's gonna come. Yeah, right? and you know, some people like they lose, you know, you know, ego loss. Like when some people are just yeah. completely gone. I've never been like that. Like I, I've, I've like in recent years, I've taken a step back from psychedelics, but I've always been the one that is trying to hold the shit together for everyone. Like not for everyone, but you mm. know, like I've been in many circumstances where somebody would just be quite, quite out there, and you're like, okay, we, we, we need to make sure like, like nothing goes wrong, 
And then that for yourself kind of ruins the feeling too, because all of a sudden you have this obligation and responsibility and that ruins the whole like, yeah. And it's, it's, I would assume it's also probably from your background, especially with strict discipline and skateboarding gymnastics and, and having this like structure. Well, the ego cannot have structure. So you have to l release that and say, I'm, I'm not in control of the situation. Let, let's just see what happens. Yeah. And even for someone like myself, where I can be a bit controlling, like you just have to give up and let it go. And it's, you oh. can hit a wall, especially on psychedelics. And it's very hard to just like, for sure. Let go. Y let go. You're right. But what I mean is like when your friend's like ripping off his clothes and running oh, into God. The, like into the street, like, no, no. <laughs> but then that friend, you, you put him on the do not do psychedelics <laughs> list. <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly so so in yeah. those cases like you you know you got to do the right thing yeah. and make sure they're okay <laughs> yeah i mean I, i've experienced this a few times with with friends and then it's just like all right next time you're, yeah you're not, you're not invited <laughs> this is why i i wanted to do it alone that night and when yeah. you tell me you, you did it alone i'm like yeah because i know myself and i know like what i can do but when it's always like someone new it's like you can take it i'll take care of you and then maybe the second time we can try it together but you know, I don't, you know, I always nine, I would say nine times out of 10, I always do it alone. Yeah, I don't, I, I there's different mushroom strains that you can do with uh, friends, like the golden teacher, they call it, which is the psilocybin cubensis. It's the big, big gold cap, right? This yeah. one is not as potent. And that's okay. It's more you get more of a laugh of a, out of it. And that one's okay to do with friends. But some of these like, uh, uh, they call them the, the Aziz, which is like, popular by Paul Stamets. Right. Um, and this comes out of Oregon. Like this one, like I wouldn't even touch. It's it's on another level. And there's other ones like that, especially in Kosamui, the Kosamui Blue Meanies. Really? <sighs> These ones are they'll take you to another planet. Interesting. That that's nearby where I'm at. Yeah, you, you probably have them out there. Um yeah. they have them on the island. You can find them. Um, but those ones are like three three or four times more potent than the other ones. Yeah. Um and those ones unless I don't even, you wouldn't even really want to do them with friends because they're more visual, meaning like it's better to, you, you take them, you sit down, you relax and you kind of go through the like kaleidoscope internally. But through that, I've, I believe it's, it's what mushrooms are doing in my opinion is they need to speak a language to you and they speak it through imagery, mm -hmm. but then you connect to it even, even by like seeing things in your mind. If, have you been down that? Have you experienced that where you're closing your eyes and you see the kaleidoscopes? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So that is speaking something to you without words. And then it connects and you go, okay, <clears throat> this is what I, I have been fucking up on. This is what I need to do. Yeah. Now the problem with that, where everyone makes the mistake is you'll get all the answers, but the next day, if you don't write them down and do them, then you're back at ground zero. Yeah. It really depends on like how much you want to take from it, you know? Yeah. And it just like any experience in life. Um, yeah. With, yeah, with mushrooms as well. Like, for example, that day or that night, um, that changed everything. Like, it made me completely leave my life in Vancouver. It took two years to execute. But, but you was, had the plan in place. Yeah, like, the feeling was there. Like, like my mind was set. Yeah. That was it. And then from that point on, like, I don't think I took mushrooms again. Well, it's not something you need to take, right? It's not... A lot of people, they, yeah, they don't understand that part. It's not like... You need to take mushrooms. And also, they're also not the answer either. If I take mushrooms, it fixes all my problems. Right. Yeah, yeah. Because, yeah, if you go into no. that like that, you're just, like, waiting, like, who's going to talk to me? Or, like, you know, like... Yeah, uh, it's, like It's it's very... Um, I, I talked to my buddy Brett about this on the weekend, and we, we were discussing that and saying, mushrooms are just one piece of the puzzle. But it's very holistic. Meaning, like, yeah, you can take mushrooms, but what's your diet? Do you exercise? Are you reading books? Yeah. Are you meditating? Do what you are you listen to your body? Like, yeah. Do, what are your relationships? What like, what news are you consuming? What media are you watching? What else, what's going on in your work life? It's it's just one part of the puzzle. If you don't have all your shit together, you can't just take mushrooms and think it fixes everything. Yeah, it, it, it will probably show you that you don't have <laughs> you your don't shit. Have to, your shit. <laughs> you, you don't have your shit yeah. together at all. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I mean, so that, that like changed everything for me. And, uh, it, it's funny because I, I'm not like a big preacher of it. I, I think it's brilliant and like, I really like uh, respect it. Um, but it's just not something I personally do that much no. and, and it ended up changing everything. And it's cool. also people need to understand it's not for everyone either. And you need yeah, to be yeah. careful, especially if you're yeah. prone to schizophrenia. Like oh, this totally. stuff, you yeah, shouldn't. Yeah. Then don't even touch it. Any history? If you, if you have, if you have schizophrenia, like an aunt, an uncle, a grandmother, 
You got to be very stay careful. Away. Stay yeah. away. And also, like, you have the people that have never, like, they've gotten drunk, they've smoked weed, they've, like, taken uppers and downers, and then they've never tried a psychedelic and then they're like, yeah, okay, like let's let's go do this party, or you know, and then they, <laughs> and then they just expect the same thing and don't realize it's a whole other category of of yeah. like experience. It's dissolving the ego, and I, I'm not a hippy dippy. I'm not gonna say, well, listen to the universe and all that shit. Yeah, I'm not into that. No, 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 I'm not going down that path. I I, I kind of come. I, I'm trying to actually come up this stuff from like more like without. I I don't like the way I phrase this either. From more like a Gary V approach, yeah. without but not so harsh. Just like. This is what it is. It's not all this universe bullshit, but essentially it's you're going to you're going to get a new perspective. Figure your shit out and go do it. If you want to wake up in the morning and meditate, fucking wake up in the morning and meditate. Don't yeah, think about yeah. it. Sam Just Harris do it. Style, man. I, love it. I don't know it. if you know Sam Harris, but Sam, like, uh, I haven't listened much to him, but no. I love that guy. Yeah, okay. just simply because he does do meditation and he has a really good app like I, there's no like you're no incentive using, you're using his meditation app yeah so at first i was using like he has like a 30-day introduction <laughs> there's yeah. no incentive in me saying this like this is yeah. genuinely i'm like so happy with having done this but you know like i have no history like i'm from like an atheist communist family right, right. so like you know like uh we don't really have much history with meditation so having this um, application was like incredible for me uh, because it starts off with five minutes a day and then he just kind of introduces to it to you very slowly but now I just <clears throat> I just set the timer yeah and how can people just I'm assuming Sam Harris meditation app probably on it's called waking up waking up I'll yeah. check this out yeah so like he was inspired uh, he was like in Stanford I think and he had an MDMA trip like before it became popular on the party scene and uh that that led him down the path of like during his 20s i think he spent a collective amount a total amount of two years like over his 20s uh in meditation retreats like the the crazy ones you know like the ones where you like give up everything and you like wake up at like like four. the t 10 days of silence retreats like yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Ones, and yeah. and like you eat like twice a day like little bowls of rice and i don't know it's nuts you sleep on the hardwood floor you like shower in like one degree water whatever like in the mountains of nepal and and so he did that but he's not religious so he took that into account and was able to kind of talk about it in the way that you are talking about like with the mushrooms and like being holistic without having to like talk about spirituality yeah, without getting too spiritual with it like it's yeah. and everyone's open to their own interpretation like yeah for me it's kind of just I think the spirituality, a lot of it, it's it's more hippy dippy wellness bullshit they're trying to sell you, and it's just like, just take it for what it is. I mean, be logical. Yeah, some people are genuinely like that, but I feel like other people, like when I speak to them, I'm like, I think you're having an identity crisis. Yeah, especially when you're <laughs> going, well, I'm gonna do this because when you start saying the universe told me and it's all this shit, it's like, all right, you know, just simple logic. Yeah, I'm, I'm like I I heard about. Uh, I hope this isn't saying too much, but <laughs> but my friend he he he's also very similar. Uh, he's he's very cool dude. He's taking care of my cats right now. Thanks, Aiden. Uh, he's um, he just did a yoga retreat in um, in Peng An, and apparently there's somebody who's a breatharian who who hadn't eaten or like yeah. had anything for four years. <laughs> I don't know if I I feel like they're probably eating and drinking water behind the scenes. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, that's coping. Definitely. That's coping Yang, yeah. and I, uh, I coping. I'm probably gonna get shot by some coping Yang. Oh here. yeah, I'm scared but, right now, dude. <laughs> well, I'm, <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm on the idea. island. They can't get here. Yeah, I can't get there. Yeah, no, yeah, you're fine. here. I'm going back. <laughs> yeah, they're just an island don't, away. Don't worry. We'll, we'll let you get to Kotal <laughs> first. But the coping Yang, the problem with them is there's too many snake oil salesmen there. There's some genuine people. Yeah. But there's like, you've heard of all the stories of the 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 rape yoga places and like the what oh you haven't heard that <laughs> say what no it's like so like what there's huge stories in Copenhagen where like they have the yoga retreats especially a couple years ago pre-current situation let's not mention that word or youtube will probably like demonetize this right. <laughs> anyways um uh their yoga retreats it's it's pretty famous the story where like girls were going but then the yogis were kind of just trying to get in their pants oh yeah but i mean like yeah, yeah okay i'm not and then like the, some a lot of them were coming out and claiming rape and they're i won't name the name of the yoga place 
but uh, you can easily find it. Yeah, well, you know, I I'm not surprised. Like, there's a lot of a lot of stuff like that. I mean, in yoga and in, in like in spirituality, I've heard this from uh, from a few. Like, I was listening to a podcast by Sam Harris, and he mm-hmm. talks a lot about that kind of stuff, where it's like people started giving their wives up, you know, for for it gets the, very culty, you know, right? It's weird, man. Yeah. I'm not into that. Like, no, no, no. It's like I like yoga. I love meditation. Like, I do them both daily. You know. It's just like, okay, like, teach me how my muscles stretch, you know? Like, I'm here to understand how my muscles stretch, what the physiological reaction is, and how I can benefit from it. Like, we're done? Okay. Like, thanks. Like, see see you next time. Like, I I don't need to hear about, like, you know, like, I I get it. Breatharian telling you not to, yeah. Yeah, yeah, like, I get it. I get it. If you want to do it, like, I'm not going to say anything about it to you like you have everyone has their life and like you know probably people think i'm like you know weird for living my life the way i do and that's cool and it's like do it but just don't push it on me yeah and i'll respect you in a public space where we can meet and in- interact but don't push it on me because that's not I, th- I think eventually what happens i don't know are you watch are you watch seinfeld at all or no oh dude i okay. love Seinfeld. so it's yeah, kind of yeah. like that that's my opinion it's like the george costanza if you tell yourself it's it's like if you tell yourself it's a lie, if you tell yourself enough times <laughs> the lie you'll believe it's the truth yeah and i think that's <laughs> what they do they just they, they a lot of these charlatans snake oil salesmen and, and it's not just copenhagen it's big in bali it's big in yeah, Go- yeah, goa it's everywhere all yeah. these like you know hi- uh, hippie retreat places ubud um, these people go there and I think they just convince themselves into the lies. I was in Copenhagen doing an ayahuasca retreat. Um, and what they did is they arranged it with maybe it was like 15, 20 people. This was probably four years ago. Um, the set and setting is fine. The people that came to do it, they were from the U S I won't say their names. I thought they were, they were pretty legit and sincere and they, they brought the, uh, they brought the, the, they actually bring all the ingredients and then make it here so that it's okay. Oh, wow. Right? Okay. And they did that. And they also had the the toad. I think it's called cambo or something like this. There's two kinds of toads. So yeah. I don't know which one you mean. But I think the, like, bufo alvaris or alvarius. I, I, I didn't do the toad yeah. burning thing because they did that at the end of the session. Burning? What? Yeah, they, like, burn you here and then put oh. the toad... Sh- that's the, that's the Amazon one, I think. Yeah. yeah. So there's one from Mexico and one from the Amazon. Yeah, it's the Amazon one. Okay. So they brought, I didn't do that. But anyways, like, so the, the, the setting was, it's supposed to be two nights. I paid for it. I only did one night. And you, you get in there. But the problem when you do it with too many people, like, we were closer than this with, like, 20 people in a circle. And everybody <laughs> had their own intention. So they go around the crowd and they're like, what's your intention? Blah, blah, blah. 90% of them were like sob stories. Like I didn't treat my son well. I cheated on my husband. So it's like all of a sudden it's just so negative in this. And like a couple of us were like, what's your intention? You're like, I don't know. Maybe I want to see an alien or I don't, (laughs) maybe I just want to like connect. I just want to see what ayahuasca does. Like, so I have no intention. Mm -hmm. I just want to try it. Yeah, I wanted to kind of like go to that DMT level experience because I've heard so much about it. And I'm like, I don't have an intention for this. Just my intention is to try it. Yeah. So I'm fine. But then like half <clears throat> like like actually before it even starts, some of these girls that were on the island that were like uh, 100% snake oil salesmen or something's wrong with them. Like before it starts, they're doing like shaking the demons out of them shit. Oh no! Like shaking around, doing all this. And you stuff. already took it? Like, no, no, we're about to take it. Oh, and I'm like, man. oh fuck. This is going to go terrible. Because, like, now, like, I immediately got negative. I'm like, I hate this girl so much right now. Yeah. <laughs> like, and, it w- and I didn't mean to. It's just, like, it was so strange. Yeah. So I'm like, Forced. because I, I start to judge them. And I get very judgmental. I'm like, there's no way she does that. She saw someone else do that at some point in her life, maybe in another ayahuasca trip. She didn't just pull that out of nowhere. So it's not like there, so, it's some not white a, chick. Yeah, some white chick, <laughs> some white chick. And I was like in her white dress with her beads and her nose pierced sure. and all this shit. Sure. I'm just like and she's shaking out the demons and I'm like, oh, all right, this is going to go terrible. But then once you tell yourself that it's too late, it's yeah. too late. And it's not that it went terrible. It just I never I went into it. I saw the kaleidoscope stuff, but I couldn't break through because like every time I did that, like you would hear someone crying in the corner, screaming there. And it made me realize like. 
any type of psychedelic from that point forward i'm like i will never do with anyone i don't know and i probably won't even do it with people i know yeah i'm like why it, it's the same idea is like would you go for a massage with 40 people in the room getting a bunch of massages like no. it's something that's more personal and private there's probably like if you're doing 40 people massages in a room i think that's <laughs> going else, in a different something direction else is going yeah. On. <laughs> yeah but that that's kind of what i took from that but um, okay, so let's let's jump back. You you've saved up. Mm -hmm. You're you're ready yeah. to, to move on now. Did you have a goal of like I need this much money? This is where I'm going. Did you know you <clears throat> were going on that like Southeast Asian backpack trail? Mm -hmm. I wanted to save twenty thousand dollars Canadian yep. and uh, just just to be free, just to have like finally not be tied down to like a job or anything but to just get you through like six months a year what did you where did you think that I, you would go to it was open-ended but i think the uh, we booked a one-way ticket but it was uh six months yeah i went i went with a girlfriend at the time uh yeah, yeah and it, it was really good um we ended up traveling through vietnam and malaysia it was very generic like looking back on it like of course it was like such an eye-opening experience but living here for a long time well, you're you on the, you're on the, the the carved path of the backpackers. You're, yeah, your Hanoi's, yeah. your Ho Chi Minh's, your precisely. Yeah, <laughs> like bang on. Yeah. Is exactly. How long they come around? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah, we did Hanoi. Went to Halong Bay. Came back to Hanoi. Flew to like Da Nang. And what, what's the name? Hoi An is it? The Hoi, Hoi An. Yeah, so yeah. you fly into Da Nang, go south to Hoi An. Yeah, yeah. Back and to Da Nang, fly down to Ho Chi Minh. Ho Chi Minh. And then we went to Phu Wok. Yeah, Phu Wok, the, the right? island. Yeah, so that was like my first taste of of the ocean, and uh, and then we flew to Malaysia where we where we visited her family, and then we went up to Thailand, which felt extremely touristy, right? Yeah. Like, it. <clears throat> I guess we were kind of trying, like at the time, we 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 thought we were experiencing like authentic travel, but obviously, like Vietnam, like going to Hanoi is not really so authentic anymore. Like, and if you're just gonna go to Halong Bay, like you want authentic, like you got to dig deep. And find yeah. some like unique experiences with locals, but um, but coming to Thailand, we arrived in Koh Lanta, went to the mushroom bar. It's yeah. coming, it's all coming back to yeah. the mushrooms today. <laughs> I rarely ever talk about them too, but um, and then like you know, just like uh, just sitting around, just seeing like, okay, wow, this is Thailand, you know. And at first, we didn't want to stay in Thailand at all. Like immediately, we were like, whoa, this is a like we wanted authentic experiences. We wanted like kind of like a bit of adversity like a little bit of like hardship just to make cool stories and experience like crazy shit and then we skipped over the west coast i don't know like i guess we just kind of weren't in the mood because of like how it west coast like phuket west coast yeah or? so like Colenta, Krabi. we went for a few days I, I okay phuket i think i stayed two days in phuket ever this is my first time back it's been six years Okay. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I've been here a month. Um, yeah. How, sure. how long now? Colanta is it's a it's a <coughs> it's authentic. It's I mean, Colanta is it's amazing. Uh, like it's off the beaten path. Oh, yeah. No, we were just we were just like young and and like yeah. honestly, I wasn't giving it a chance because I'm still here, right? Yeah. It's been so long, and I I, I love Thailand. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, it's amazing. So. We decided to skip over it. My friend was telling me about this island where you can do scuba diving. I was like, what's that called again? He's like, Koh Tao. I'm like, oh, cool. Let's check it out. We get to Koh Tao. Um, we arrive. And, like, the pier is so busy. Like, everyone's, like, trying to hassle you. And we just immediately were like, oh, we don't want to be here either. Like, okay, screw South Thailand. Like, we don't like it. We're going to go up north. Which is, like, you know, I'm thinking back on this now. Like, what the hell are you talking about? But we... Decided to stay one day. We booked a ticket to go to Bangkok like the following day. And then we we just happened to walk into a dive shop and ask them about a, a scuba course. And uh, we decided to sign up because it started to feel like a bit of a, a it's a pity to just like come into Thailand and skip South Thailand because it's like so beautiful. And, you know, we kind of were hoping to like it and it wasn't, you know. And also you're traveling with someone else, so you're kind of compromising a little bit of what you want. I do love traveling alone mm. quite a bit because you can just, like, as long as you are good at, you know, feeling comfortable by yourself, like, it's it's amazing. Um, so we, we, we did the scuba course, and she fell in love. No, but the scuba course, you, you, you're you in Bangkok at this point? Or? Oh, no, sorry. So, so yeah, sorry, I got... 
you you're in Koh Tao and you're thinking to leave, but you stayed. Yeah. So okay. sorry. I I, I sh so I should clarify. We had a ticket to leave that day, and then we decided to take the course, and then we just scrapped the ticket, and we stayed for the open water course, Patty Open Water, yeah. and then we did the advanced course, then the rescue course, and then we were there for like four oh, months. Oh shit! You stayed the because the, the rescue course is next level. I mean, that's yeah. Well, I mean, it's like. I forget how many days now, man, it's been so long, but it was like, you know, yeah, I just did it. I was an athletic guy and it was fine. And then, um, and then we did the dive master course. But dive master, th is, don't you have to stay for almost three months for that? Yeah. Like, yeah. like people do it in less time, but like, I, I have no, like, I have no problem saying like you, you will get the certification, but nobody's going to respect your, your experience level at all. Like if you leave Koh Tao, like you, it's going to be hard for you to find a job unless you put some time in in Koh Tao and make sure you're at a reputable place because uh, people get certified there that like don't deserve to be certified. Yeah. I don't have any problem saying that because uh, there's some really amazing divers there, scuba and free diving, like very knowledgeable people that I really respect. And then there's just complete like just, you know, egocentric. Yeah, I mean, there because yeah. it's part of a lot of, People need to understand that the reason why backpackers go to Koh Tao is because it's the cheapest place to get those certifications. Right, yeah. And everyone's yeah. on a budget, and they know that. So yeah. they go, okay, well, I'm not going to do it in PP, and I'm not going to do it in Phuket because Phuket's kind of shit for diving. Well, it's not that it's shit. It's just complicated. Dude, I, I'm in love with it, but it is logistically way more difficult. It's logistically difficult because yeah. you got to go down to Koh Rach. Have you, I'm sure you've been down to Koh Ratcha. Russia, or yeah, yeah, Karach, uh, Russia. Russia. It's o it's it's okay there, but there's not much <laughs> like maybe I I've dove there before, but yeah. I didn't see there wasn't much wildlife or reef. Oh, uh, I mean mantas come around there, really? Yeah, I've never, yeah. I mean, yeah. And this could have been also I think a lot's coming back now because of the current situation. Like for sure, that life is coming back as yeah. well. But yeah, the point was yeah. So people go to Koh Tao to do their open water. Just because they can save some yeah. cash and they're in Kota. Yeah, there's there are so many choices and there's so many amazing choices. But you know, like when you're looking at a website, you have no idea. Like yeah. for all you know, it could be just someone who got like became an instructor like very recently and they decided to start their own <laughs> business. So it, it's important to do your research. And then this goes not just for Kota. This goes for everywhere. Yeah. Um, so we did the dive master course. We stayed for a very long time, like four months or something. I think I think about four, and then we moved on to Bangkok, went to Indonesia, came back, and just did the travel thing. And I went back to back home after six months. And I was home, and it was like November. What what like, year is this at this point? Man, I'm I'm so bad with remembering. I think it was 2014 or 2015. 2015. Okay. Yeah, so I think I returned back 2015. I sold all of my um, land photography bits, like. External flashes, pocket wizards, uh, my Hasselblad, uh, like all my film equipment, all the lenses I would have need, and just bought a housing for my camera. Mm -hmm. And I'd, I'd never shot underwater. Like for the time I was doing the dive master course, my camera was just like rotting away in my bag. I, I did not touch it at all. So at, th this is, at this point, this is when you're, you're selling your equipment to try to get into underwater photography. Yep. Yeah, I just decided like, again, like almost like before I was like, no, I want to be back there, and I want to shoot underwater. So at this point, you is this when you're shooting with the the D seven hundred or five hundred? I had the D three hundred when I first yeah um, started, and then I upgraded to the D seven hundred, which is exactly the same. Yeah, I was reading you frame. had the seven hundred, and then your housing you upgraded to the Sabul. Am I correct? Subal, Subal, nicely done. Yeah, on my research. Good. Oh snap! <laughs> yeah, so um, so. Yeah, at first I had this like terrible housing. I bought this like it's called an Equinox housing, and yeah, and, yeah I'm sorry guys, you suck. Like <laughs> you <laughs> fucking suck. Yeah, I mean like the customer service was terrible. Like it broke after three months, and then I just realized like yeah, if you want it, if you want the right thing, you you need to um you need to just get the right gear. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I, that's exactly like like this yeah. here. Like we're like we're not getting the the, the lowest of the low. Yeah. When you when if you're gonna do it, do it right. Exactly, right? exactly. So I realized that, and I've never looked back since. I, I went for Subal. Um, they're an amazing camera manufacturer. I'm not gonna bore you as to why, yeah, but yeah, like, yeah. but but if anybody wants to ask me, I'm more than happy to elaborate. They can send me a message. Yeah. Um, and then I upgraded. To, oh, 
kind of upgrade d500 so i went from a full frame to a crop frame camera uh like four years ago or three years ago now i'm really bad at keeping oh don't don't worry about, about the yeah. dates but at, at this point you've you you have your 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 dive master and you're deciding to get into underwater photography yeah how did that decision come together oh man it was like it was a mess like like i just kind of like to throw myself into situations and i find myself like overwhelmed with anxiety and stress mm. but then it's like no you wanted this and a kind of a bit of stubbornness and perseverance to get me through um probably from my earlier days uh but Don't worry, this isn't a therapy session yeah <laughs> <laughs> no 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 but i'm just trying to think like yeah, logically that, like because when i look when i think back on it like because there had yeah. to be like you said you sold your equipment so that's a big decision to say i'm going full on into underwater photography yeah, yeah. can you re recall like the, the day or that 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 you know aha moment yeah i was working like with my friend uh at uh skateboard distribution which is an amazing place i was actually quite happy there i just wasn't happy with the weather in vancouver and i just was thinking of the year ahead and how winter was coming and the days were getting very short and yeah. very dark and cold and i'm like no like i just did i just skipped last winter i don't want to i don't want to experience this winter at all like yeah. it sucks and so i was like okay like set set a goal just i still had money left over from traveling and just sold the extra stuff. I'm like, you won't need it. It's a one-way ticket. And I arrived in Kotao again, because that's all I knew. Mm -hmm. And with this gear that I didn't didn't even know how to use. And decided to just, just like start diving. So I went to the dive shop I was at. And within a week, I think, because you get free diving for life at the shop I was at. So it was like, they're like, probably like, let's get this guy out of here. And they're like, hey, there's like a... Because you did your dive master. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So so that's sometimes offered. But then also, and uh, people should understand that free diving for life, but you have to help them on the boat, I'm assuming. Well, right? scuba diving. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Free, oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry, sorry. It's scuba diving, but it's free diving Free scuba diving. Yeah, free for life. scuba diving yeah. for life. <laughs> but as long as you're yeah. moving tanks around and setting people up when oh, you're totally. something yeah. like this. I mean, it's it's yeah, of course. It's yeah. inherently that's what you want to do if you're if you're yeah. a kind person. Yeah. Yeah. If you're get, if you're getting free dives. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um but then after a week they're like, Hey, there's a job opening for a photographer at this other resort. And I was like, Whoa, really? So I just kind of messaged them and they're like, Yeah, cool, come down. I'm like, Yeah, I got all this experience, you know. Just like all this confidence I'd been in the water like two days with my camera. I'm like, yeah, I'll just make it work. Like I went to school and I was like very quickly humbled by how difficult it was <laughs> and just realized like colors were completely a mess. Like like the distortion of like underwater, everything's magnified. So whatever lens you have, it's magnified underwater. If you get a 35 millimeter lens, like it's not going to be a 35 millimeter lens. It's going to be like a 50 something millimeter lens. And it depends on the size of your dome and if it's a flat port and like how deep you are and like relation and all, to the all this and stuff, all the, this uh, experience you're learning more on the technical side. Is this just trial and error from experience or were you kind of doing some research as well? Well, that I mean, the fact that I took a program helped me a lot because okay. I was really obsessed. But I think like also at that point, I was a bit like, damn, like I can't believe how bad I am at this. Because, you know? well... I'm assuming the underwater photography, it's a completely different world. Yeah. Like it in builds especially on it. In, in terms of the light and the light control and understanding how yeah, that works. It's nuts. Yeah. It builds on it. Like yeah. it's a different realm and light works very differently. And you need to remember a lot of rules of physics to yeah. be able to execute it properly. Like there are certain things like, uh, okay, I'm not going to go on a, on yeah, a we won't lecture, get, we but, won't get too technical because, yeah. uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but, yeah. but, but, but what I wanted to say was like, there are certain things like in your photo when you take a photo and you look at the back of your camera and everything's blue, but you know, like you can bring out like beautiful colors out of it if you understand the physics of what you just captured because you're capturing raw files, which is data. You're not just capturing like the one image. You're capturing like a whole bulk of information and like the camera's just giving you a sample. So like keeping all this in mind, it makes it... Um, it's totally doable, but to make it intuitive takes a lot of practice. And uh, I didn't realize that. I was very humbled right away. And uh, and my boss was like, uh, like, do you know how to white balance? Like, so this Shit. is more like on the, the Photoshopping yeah. side of, of things to really bring that out. 
or or, or can you capture it like naturally in raw form well yeah you like raw files are not a definitive color like raw files are like you can like if you're talking about photoshop you slide it back and forth and it doesn't matter what color you make it that's all a raw file without being changed like the raw file is just like a sample and an automatic reading of white balance from the camera which is not always correct so mm. raw files make it possible to like um exploit the colors and 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 uh you can exaggerate them but you have to shoot in raw is there any like yeah. analogy photographers will use to to make people that are that are not so uh, adverse in the in that world of um you know yes this is the raw file but for example at the end photo that you're going to post on your instagram is yeah it's gonna it's day and night they're going to be two different oh, things right yeah i mean yeah you you don't want to like like frankenstein the shit yeah. out of it but yeah i mean of course I guess the best way is like a raw file is more than you need. So if you think of like building a house or making a dress or making food or like anything, you start off with more materials than you end up with, right? Like if you were making like, let's say like a piece of clothing, you're not going to use all of the fabric. There's some that you're going to trim away. And the raw file is like that. It gives yeah. you the flexibility to go in one direction or the other. Um, like you're not going to use every single piece of wood for building yeah. a house. You're going to have something you... It's it's the, the the beginning ingredients for the recipe you're gonna cook and yeah present yeah it's just like the bulk of what yeah. you need and then so, you work from there so you you were starting with the underground photography at this point and you get this job it's at a resort now are you in scuba gear at this point so you're going down to like 15 20 meters yeah and are they also in scuba gear or yeah. are they free diving yeah so this is like years before I started free diving yeah. I I did not even think about free diving at that time. I was all scuba. I was shooting up to 35 meters, you know, um, usually shallower is better though. Um, but yeah, just scuba diving and yeah. I got obsessed with scuba diving. And then I took a, another photography program for underwater photography with Alex Terrell, who's in Kotao and he's very good teacher. And it was a one month course. It was like intense. Mm -hmm. It was like every day, like lecture dive and the dives he was doing are like very long so so traditionally people dive like what 40 minutes 50 40 50 minutes, minutes yeah. yeah we were doing like 80 90 minute dives on one tank yeah and then coming up and then taking a break and doing another one. Oh shit yeah so it was crazy like and was that for for photography reasons or was it just for yeah it was an underwater photography course yeah. and so it was all dedicated to shooting underwater yeah. And he was like so supportive of me, um, even even before I took the course with him. He's like such a helpful guy. And then when I took the course with him, I was like really grateful for the knowledge that he gave me, and it really helped me to understand scuba photography, which is not the same thing as free diving photography. Well, especially at that that depth. I mean, the the blues are much more darker, and and obviously the closer you are to the surface, I mean, you have more ambient light you can deal with. So yeah. Yeah. When, when you're at those depths, are, are you using uh, equipment like strobes? And what else are you using to make that happen? Yeah, with scuba, I use strobes. Like with freediving photography, I don't like strobes at all. Yeah. Because they don't really like, the light fades off, falls off very quickly. So unless someone's really close to you, like you're not really going to get the benefit of the strobe at all. Mm -hmm. So I, I tend to just avoid using it. But I mean, there is value for it. And I've seen some very innovative photographers doing their own thing. And making amazing like freediving photography with strobes, uh, but it's m more tailored towards scuba photography, I think. And I, I was watching one of the videos uh, you did. It's the is it the crystal wreck? Were you doing a lot of uh, photography? There's a crystal wreck off of Kotao. Is that correct? Uh, there is like um there is there is a there's a few wrecks uh the one y you might mean is there's a resort <laughs> called crystal dive resort okay so maybe that's how they connected that yeah and then there's like they they have a few places where where they've like they have some of their old boats that they sunk but there's only one main one but it's collapsed now okay and then there's a giant warship like world war Two, like u.s warship that was uh it was given to Thailand and decommissioned, and then they sunk it as an artificial reef. And that thing is super deep. Uh, the problem is they strategically put it in, like, the worst place ever. Like, the visibility is always bad there. I've been di like I've dived it, like, hundreds of times, and I have not been able to get a good day to shoot it. How deep is it? It starts at, like, 
22, but like all the good stuff's around 25, 26. And that's getting qu- quite quite deep for for diving. I, I mean, yeah. I, I've done I've I've been diving all around Southeast Asia, and I find anything after 25 and 30, I mean, kind of life disappears until you get really deep, and then obviously, yeah, uh, it gets much larger. But even co PP, these like 10, 15 meters, there's tons, yeah, a lot to see. Yeah, I mean, if you go Indonesia where the water is like kilometers yeah. deep then you have very clear water down there and you have like really good life. There's a place in Indonesia called the Sangihe Archipelago and there like most of the cool life starts at around 30 and like all the fish live super deep. But in Thailand, you're right. Um, And it's not a very deep ocean in Thailand. So it's like all the bad water settles down and it settles at the bottom. And if the bottom's shallow, then the bad water is like pretty much near the surface, right? Um, so that wreck is amazing, but it's like once a year you get like perfect conditions there. And, uh, I like to free dive now. So if I'm going to photograph it, it'll be on my holding my breath. And it's obviously, um, very hard to line up with your schedule and knowing when the ocean's going to be clear enough. And, Mm. but I tried, I've, I've been trying, it just doesn't work. (laughs) Yeah. Well, well, okay. We'll jump into the free diving. I wanted to ask an interesting story that I, I heard. Uh, from your side, and I think if you want to tell it for for the li- our, all our four listeners, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, up by the San- Sangi Pelago, I was listening to a story of where you guys moored at the side of a volcano. You want to yeah. share that story? Yeah, I mean, like the the truth is, uh, the part I left out is like our boat had broken down the day before, and we were like stuck out at sea with winds and like strong waves and the owner of the boat decided sails were not worth having because we had like a motor which is well in that situation like the worst thing that could have happened so we couldn't even sail our way back to an island and so the Sangihe archipelago is like between indonesia and philippines, philippines. it's like quite a remote area to go to and dangerous for pirates yeah and there's pirates yeah, there. everywhere damn it it was like <laughs> sketchy it was 10 30 p.m and I'm like sleeping in a bunk bed because oh no, I had my own room that trip, and then, and then it was like all hands on deck, like, and we would just run up, and I'm like, what's going on? It's like, like engines broken. There's a part that you know, like the mechan- like the engineer does not have like the spare part. <sighs> and yeah. then and then like and then we took two speed like of the tender boats, like I wouldn't call them speed boats, they're just two tender boats, like, and tied them to the to this giant, giant liveaboard, like huge boat and just towed it. And it took like 20 hours to tow it like to an island that was just like right in front of us, you know? Holy shit. Yeah. And then, and then in the end, like here we are stuck on one of these little islands in the archipelago and we, yeah, this part ain't coming anytime soon. And these people are paying thousands of dollars for this trip. So what are we going to do? And my friend Daniel, who's an amazing dive guide and dive uh, cruise director, he he's like, yeah, he was just like looking at the islands. He's like, this bay looks kind of cool. And it turned out to be one of my favorite dives, uh, not for the life I saw, even though I did see some very beautiful, like very gorgeous, like uh, macro life, like very small, rare critters. But it was just the experience of like the rumbling cave you know, or not the caves, the, <laughs> the, vol- the, the volcano. volcano. Yeah, the yeah. rumbling volcano and like. Every minute, two minutes, like you could hear like a. Could you feel it? Yeah, it's like it's almost like bass at like a like a festival or something Mm -hmm. like from very loud speakers where it just vibrates to your body, and uh, it's crazy. Like um, I thought it was very spectacular. I have not experienced. Was there any danger there because it is an active volcano, right? Yeah, I mean, but most of Indonesia's just dealing with that shit yeah, like i don't know it, that like the, you could see the crater glowing red at night yeah but like life just went on so i was like okay like no one else is acting up so i'm not gonna do anything and are these habitable islands people are living on them as well or they're yeah. basically just volcano dude rocks it's crazy like when you sail through indonesia like you will sail like for days like from anywhere near an airport and you just arrive on this really remote island and you'll just see villages like churches or mosques depending on which which region and like yeah we always used to visit them and and that was one of my favorite experiences is like going to visit this town that you know clearly like a boat comes there once a week that like does like a circuit around like the just for diving 
Yeah, no, I mean like like if they wanted to leave like a ferry to, oh, okay. to take them to come and go, it would probably be like, yeah, once a week one will show up and then they can go. And then it's like a multi-day trip or something. It, I don't really know exactly because it's different everywhere. But yeah. but they're welcoming when you, you come to these islands. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah, it's, they're super they're not curious. Like, this is like that classic, like, you know, they've rarely or never seen white people before yeah. kind of situation. And you're like, whoa, like, it's amazing. Like, like it's it's really cool because, you know, they're very curious. They, they kind of approach you like the kids want to play with you and you know yeah. i can speak a bit of bahasa like mm -hmm. indonesia so like that that's kind of even cooler so the, uh, I, I would be surprised them. that they'd even be speaking bahasa i would assume they were speaking like maybe their own language of that island they do they yeah. do but i think in school they have to learn the at least the colloquial yeah. version of yeah. bahasa and probably television too if, i'm sure they sure. they have yeah. some sort of satellite television that's working out there yeah yeah it's not right. like so don't imagine like yeah, it's, just dirt roads like there's still paved roads yeah it's not the amazon you know people with needles through their nose yeah. and yeah running around in loincloths i'm sure they're there but yeah. we we never got that yeah. deep cuz uh usually like there's such ocean people so everything's like yeah. just on the water but you know in Papua New Guinea or in Papua province of Indonesia, which, you know, shares yep. the same island, is um, it has, like, still the cannibal tribes and stuff. And that's where we were based out of Papua in Sarong. But, I mean, I don't think we were within, I, I don't think we were within, like, days of trekking of anything like that. Yeah, those places, I, I, I think Port Mosby is, like, this is, like, murder capital of the world. Port Mosby, yeah, yeah like... Like you don't want to, I, I was going to go travel there like four years ago. Um, I've been, I've been to every country pretty much in Asia, except nice. for Nepal and uh, Papua New Guinea oh. and in Palau, maybe that's about it. Uh -huh. But I had the option. I was doing the research. Okay. I'm going to go to Port Mosby. I'm going to Papua New Guinea. And like the more I looked into it, even my friends from Papua New Guinea were like, do not <laughs> go there. I'm like, why? They're yeah. like, you need a, a security guy with you the whole time yeah like, you I, can't you can't just show up at the airport and start walking around it's like one of the only places in southeast asia that i can think of where it's very dangerous it's it's strange because like you know like the papuan people you know like they're all from the same island but i guess like back in the day they created a border you know yeah. but like culturally papuan people look very different than like western indonesian people um, but the Papuan people in Indonesia are like so kind. Like I can walk around in Sarong on that side of the island. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's enormous, right? The island, yeah, it's huge, like huge. But yeah, on that end, like yeah, you can walk around the the, the town, the the city is nothing to brag about. It's yeah, of course. it's a bit of a oh, it's way. Uh, I mean, even to probably get there by a flight from here could take probably eight hours. It's it's by, more. It's, it's an overnight trip. Like yeah, it's, it's not no, direct. Nowhere near close. So yeah. back back to kind of that story. I was going to go to Papua New Guinea, and then I, I I I wanted to see something off the beaten path. So I went to East Timor, and oh, I went yeah. out to Dili. And uh, have have you been there before? No. So I went to Dili, but to the East Timor, the countryside, because Indonesia and the it's called like I think there's another there, the island split split in two and one half of the island is actually Indonesia the other half is Timor Leste Timor Leste East Timor yeah um, but then I went diving off another island off East Timor which is part of East Timor uh -huh. and this country is it's it's something else it's yeah. all run by the Portuguese the food is amazing the people are oh, yes. friendly it was super safe. The problem was like when you land in Dili, there's nothing to do. Like you can go on a road that's maybe like five kilometers. And then to see the rest of the island, it's super expensive. Like right. if you want to do a day trip or a, what a, or a day and a half trip, they'll take you way up into the mountains. Yeah. Um, but just to go for the day, it's like a thousand bucks a person. Okay. Just because all the people that visit there, they're usually from the UN. And the UN is business pens expense paid. So every time you go to a tour guide to go to those places, they're like, I can take one person a week or, you know, I can take 10 people a day. They're like, I'd rather just charge a thousand dollars a person. And I only need to do this once a week. Yeah. Fair enough. And then that's what yeah. they told, told me. I'm like, all right, that makes sense. I'm not going to do it. So, but then I went uh, drift diving, scuba diving off an Island. I forget the name of it, but it's part of uh, Timor Leste. Mm -hmm. and uh oh it was amazing we saw not uh i forget the name of the whale but it was a smaller type of whale we were going out there and when you get to this island you're 
they pretty much just take you right off the, the cliff of the island. You drop down and you just like drift dive the whole cliff for right. about two kilometers or something. Nice, yeah. But it's, those. yeah, well, the thing is you don't move. You can't move. Exactly. Like, yeah, I love them. You're, but the problem is things sitting. go by and like you want to see and... Right, when that happens, for photographers, yeah. it's such a tease, too. Yeah. Like, no, come back. There's no, like, if you try to turn around and fight that current, like, you're you're going as hard as you can, and you're not moving. Yeah, it's terrible. Yeah, yeah like, getting stuck in currents is, is definitely a thing in Indonesia. Like, yeah. that ocean is so deep, and when the tides change, and it funnels through shallower water, like, the water is just pushed through with so much force. And that's what creates all of that, like, very intense current. But it is also the the main reason why the life there is so diverse because... The nutrients are... The nutrients, the eggs, like, all of that, like, gets gets so well distributed. Mm-hmm. And uh, the water clears very easily. It's it's incredible. Like, I, I love it. Um, so next, we're just going to jump into your experience uh, at Raja Ampa, in which, from my understanding, that's where you went after your first time in Kotal. Exactly. So I took this course with Alex and then I went with him on a trip to Manado uh, to Lembe Strait, which is just off of Manado. And that was insane. Like um, it blew my mind to see Indonesia and I just immediately wanted to go again. One of those pivotal points in my life where I'm like, this has to happen. So I immediately tried to look for a job and a friend connected me with someone who didn't really trust me because I was from Kotao. So it was like kind of hard to, to get their confidence. But I showed up. Um, I flew in to Biak, which is in Chenderwasi Bay, which is east of in, uh, Raja Ampa, like way farther east, like almost on the border with Papua New Guinea. And like land in this like little one single strip airport and just like everyone's staring at me like I'm an alien. And yeah. And I don't know anyone I'm about to meet or what life I'm about to go into. And that morning, I remember it very vividly. Like, of course, I didn't sleep the night before, you know, and showing up on the boat. And then, okay, I have to learn a new language. I need to learn how to live on a boat and work on a boat. I don't know any of the dive sites. And we did two trips there. So that was a total of 20 days. And then we sailed over to Raja Ampat. So we sailed west. And then I spent about eight months diving Raja Ampat. Just living on the liveaboard. Yeah. Yeah, the trips were, like, most of the trips were 10 days on, four dives a day, guaranteed 70 minutes per dive to the the, the guests, so, like, four hours underwater per day, scuba diving. Uh, Sometimes they were shorter, but, you know, that's how much you guarantee as a dive guide. And just started started figuring it all out. After about a... We arrived in Raja Ampat, so I'd been there for a month, on this boat, we did one trip in Raja Ampat and the boat needed maintenance. So I flew over to Bali for for two or three weeks. And So you're going back to the mainland where the airport is to, to be able to fly, fly to Bali. Yeah. And this airport, like, is it a 50-seater? Like, what is, this, what is the size of these planes? I can't imagine they're large. Right. So where I flew in in Biak was, like, super far. So we sailed, like, huge distances yeah. to arrive in Raja Ampat. So then I was near the city of Sarong. So this is the city that everybody flies into if they want to dive in Raja Ampat and the liveaboards go there to pick them up. It's about four hours from from where Raja Ampat starts, four hour sail. Yep. Um, so that airport was bigger. It was like they recently redid it, but I heard before it was exactly like the other one. Uh, and it was... Dominique Edouard Airport, I think it's like four or five strips, you know, you have like three or four airlines that go through there. It's recent, re- relatively modern, like marble floors, like big, like open kind of, you know, airporty vibe. So I, I think uh, if you can describe Raja Ampat, because I, I, I'm a diver, I've done my research, but this is like a diver's dream. This is a yeah. paradise. Oh, yeah. So you're talking like classic turquoise water. I mean, and and. People need to understand this is a luxury, like live aboard when people go there. Like, yeah, to get there, first of all, it's very difficult, and second of all, once you are there, it's not cheap. Yeah, yeah. So, pretty much like everything's against you for <laughs> from the beginning. <laughs> yeah. But when you get there, like I, I assure you, first of all, for before I start, like, don't go there on your first trip because you're just gonna be like very disappointed with the rest of the world. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's yeah. so cra- it's the most incredible place I've ever been and I dived there for eight months and 
After there, I dived other places like Maldives and Palau and other parts of Indonesia, and like nothing really compares. What about Samilian? Is that comparable at uh, all? The the Similan Islands are very beautiful. I've not dived them, but okay. from like the footage I've seen, I would happily go there and enjoy it. But no, that's what hap- happened to me. I did a uh, uh, Rachia R- Rachia Rock Rach- Richelieu Rock Richelieu Rock. I did this. When I first arrived in, in Phuket, maybe the first six months or whatever, that's where I did my advance. I'd stayed on the boat for four days. Oh, that's awesome. But um, it ruined diving. Yeah, because, because after it's I the, went it's there, the best they're dive like, site in I've yeah. never went, like, I'll go to PP, but it's like, yeah, it's good. But, like, then I won't go to Koh or whatever. Right, that's because why you like, said that about Russia, like, right? Okay, I've been okay. to Samilian, and it's like, there's, I, I've yet to see anything at that level anywhere even in southeast asia okay well but yeah you you would be impressed with Raja Raja. yeah i've, I've heard because yeah. of raja now you stayed there for for eight months you were diving were you doing like four dives a day for eight months yeah we would get like well i mean sometimes you would have to do a crossing so it's a very big area so before i launch into that just to explain the layout of raja Ampat, it's div- it's four islands like what raja Ampat means is four kings that's what it translates into like four big islands and they're span like a huge distance if i'm not mistaken like 200 300 kilometers north to south so you split the trip between the south and the north and the south it takes like 14 hours sailing 12 hours sailing so as soon as the guests get on the boat from the airport like you just immediately leave the harbor you get the clearance papers and you're off and then you're sailing to misol which is the southernmost island and it's incredible it looks nothing like the north so the north and the south look nothing alike and what you what you hope to expect there is very different um the south looks a lot like the landscape of krabi uh and pp and like these towering cliffs limestone cliffs, limestone yeah. exactly like very similar in that regard aside from the vegetation being very different and you have very beautiful overhangs like very very interesting formations and light uh, the ocean is quite deep, so you have walls. You d- you don't d- ever do drift diving. You you rarely ever drift in Raja Ampat. You try and like plan it in a way where you stay in like one specific area. But is it deep or you, you, like the ocean is deep, but the dive sites you like it's very beautiful, shallow. Um, the hot spot in Raja Ampat's like ten to twenty meters. Like if you want all the fish and stuff, they're kind of like fifteen twenty. If you want the pygmy seahorses, like the little seahorses that look exactly like the sea fan, they start at about fifteen, but you're more likely to find them on the sea fans below twenty meters. So it really depends on what people are looking for. Like if they want macro, like really rare little stuff, like nudie branks and weird crazy, sh- crazy shit like that you need to go deeper. Um, if you're looking for wide angle photography and beautiful landscapes and you just want to enjoy the sea fans and the colors, you stay shallow. So there's something for everyone. Uh, in the South, like there's no repetition. So you don't really get much of the same thing. Like every single dive site is very different. The formation, sometimes you're diving along a wall. Sometimes you're diving like um, a specific pinnacle, like something that doesn't reach the surface. Sometimes you're diving like in, in like a blue hole, for example. There's a dive site like that there. And then in the north, you have schooling fish. You have a lot of like underwater like ridges and pinnacles, uh, like very beautiful piers, like jetties that are incredibly lush in life. Like my favorite dive site in Rajampat is a pier, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, actually, it's so in like the north. Actual yeah. pier for, for boats coming in. And yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just like the most amazing place. It's called Soundarek. I've also seen it be called Sawoundarek. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's in the Dampier Strait in the north. In the south, there's a dive site called Magic Mountain or Shadow Reef or Karangbayangan. It has three names. And it has like oceanic mantas, reef mantas, like every species of fish in Raja Ampat, like schooling everywhere, action, like hunting, macro turtles like dolphins have come by there it's it, it is by far the most all-encompassing it sounds very, it's very diverse then and yeah for someone yeah. like yourself like that's what that's my one turn off from from diving is like i get bored yeah like, not there like you for, won't you that's won't. what i mean like you go to pp it's like after my third dive i'm like it's, i'm kind of it's over so it. dynamic like yeah. you don't know what to expect with every dive like mobula rays like giant like 
just giant schools of them like hunting together. Uh, man, it's such a show. So every time you're going, again, you don't know what to expect and you can see something different in, yeah. in that sense. So you, you're okay. Like, would you go back and live there at some point? Like, is that in the books? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> you, you've done it. You're over it. Um, well, the live aboard life, like, uh, is pretty tough if you're yeah. working. Like, I would go back for a trip anytime. But, like, uh, yeah, I was, like, work to the bone. Yeah. Those live aboards, I, again, I've only did four days. And, like, by the fourth day, like, the food's got to be an issue. No, not on the not in okay. not on these boats. Yeah, it's it's good. more luxury than that. Oh yeah. Okay, because yeah. I know I did one and it, I I don't know what I must have spent maybe forty thousand baht for, but it, but the advance was included. But again, it's like by the fourth day, it's like I can only eat fried rice and shrimp and yeah, it's no, very no, repetitive. No, no. no it's yeah. not. They're they're very good. Like like the boats, the standard out in Raja Ampat's crazy. If yeah. you if you want to get a sample of what Raja Ampat is like, I would say Komodo is a very good place yeah. to start and i went to komodo after and i loved it and it was very unique but there were like Isn't a it lot of pink something to do with pink uh, komodo uh, there's pink? a there's like a pink beach like pink like the beach, pink yeah. sand yes yeah so there's a type of coral that does not grow in raja ampat which is like a like a red coral and people use it for jewelry a lot because when coral like dies and it just becomes white but this one is red mm. and uh you know it's unfortunate because people will try and harvest it but the beaches are pink because it disintegrates and mixes with the rest of the limestone. Ah, okay, so that's how that's yeah. how it works. I actually I so looked cool. into going to Komodo as well before I went to East Timor. Uh, the problem was uh, my girlfriend at the time she did she's not a diver, and and let you, you have to be, do the liveaboard. I didn't realize that because you land in Komodo, but then the liveaboard takes you like four or five hours way out. You can do a day trip, but it's like shitty being in the city. There's not much to do. Yeah. And uh, but I, there's one like eco eco lodge resort out there, but I looked into that one and it was like so you didn't have to live on the boat, but it's like fully booked for like the year. Yeah, like you can't even get in this place. I would say live aboard. Like yeah. like there's budget options as well, which is really good because you can experience like most of what like the luxury live aboards give you um, in Komodo there if you're just there for the diving. Like if you want comfort, you should do the luxury one. Uh, but if you're just there for diehard diving and you don't care about Get sleeping in, in bunks, you can. That's available. Mm. But, yeah, in terms of Raja Ampat, like, the area is enormous. And in, like, you you do four or five days in the south, and just as soon as you start feeling like how you explain, where you're like, oh, okay, maybe, maybe I'm starting to kind of get the gist of it, you head north. And then the north, it's like, whoa. Like, the landscape is completely different. The limestone cliffs are gone. You have, like, regular-looking islands, but, like, birds of paradise live around there. So, like, Wh if What's you, that, birds of paradise? The birds of paradise is, like, um, like the, like the um, a genus of, like... So there's, like, 39 species of birds of paradise. I think I could be wrong about the number, but something in the 30s, and they're, like, very extravagant birds. Like, David Attenborough has talked about them a lot. Like, they're the ones that dance, like, do, like, these weird, like ritualistic mating dances they like mm. clean up like they literally scrub the their tree roots like around their place they clean up every leaf um like that's the wilson's bird of paradise and that's like one species then some live like in the mid range of the they're trees. on the northern part of raja Ampat. that's where they're living yeah so so like they're kind of scattered across that area all of them i saw two species which is super cool because mm. like as i don't I'm not really a birder but like if you were it would be like seeing like the holy grail yeah. on your first experience and you're like is this, is this good like yeah it's good yeah these are but pretty it, it's cool rare birds. to see them as well even when you are there well you need to have a guide like yeah. so so there was one trip where we just had like these birders or tw twi twitchers or sure. whatever whatever they're I, don't, called. I don't know the terminology yeah the these birders like rented the boat or chartered the boat for um for like 14 days and we started going to all these islands around Raja Ampat that like aren't good for diving but we just started going like deep into the jungle and it would be like wake up like for the birds of paradise we woke up at like 3 a.m and we had to be up before sunrise and we were hiking through the jungle and I'm like sitting in the silence at the spot where the the red bird of paradise is going to be like at sunrise and I'm looking over and there's this like bioluminescent like fungus like growing on the street it was like a tiny dot you know mm. it was like straight out of avatar though like i was still just bl blown away and like as i was a photographer but on that trip i was a porter yeah right 
<laughs> and then they're all like, okay, how do I work my cameras? I'm like, okay, I'll carry them for you and like set them up, like which kind of factors into why I said I probably won't go back, like as as like a, a like somebody working there. But I would I would go back in a because they're working you to the bone there because there's a certain um, you know standard that people expect. Yeah, and I mean I want to be a like I want to yeah. do everything as best as I can. Like if I'm there and I'm doing that job, like I want to do a really good job, you know, as best as I can. Mm. So what, what was your most memorable experience um, diving, scuba diving, let's say, um, whether it's in Southeast Asia or, and, and we didn't even dig deep into if you've been diving in Europe or South America. I'm not. No. no. So <laughs> just in Southeast Asia, do you have like one experience or w would it be that volcano story? Is there anything outside of that that really hits home? Well, like in terms of like a good experience or can I just say like anything? anything? Yeah. Anything. So there is one dive we did in the Banda Sea. And I'd always heard that Indonesia had like downwellings, like currents that push you down or like, you know. So, just yeah, explain that a, a, a bit more so we can. Yeah. It, so it's the currents actually pushing you down instead yeah. of left or right. Or exactly. Okay. So pe so people tend to think that currents just kind of move like laterally, like horizontally, like move you left or right. But they can move you up and down. And uh, we experience that, you know, it's, it's common and you just need to understand like how water moves and how to avoid it. So we were in this island in the Banda Sea and I don't really remember the name and I've been, I, I've asked about it, but I don't remember the name anyway. Um, well, and, and let's uh, give a, a region. Where is the Banda Sea? This is Indonesia, I'm guessing. Yeah. So Banda Sea is between like the region of Raja Ampat and, and uh, Ambon. Mm. Uh, and uh, Saram, so like just middle Indonesia, like east middle okay. kind of area. The ocean's super deep, so if you're crossing that ocean and the weather gets bad, like you're stuck in like enormous storms, like sketchy, like really scary. Um, luckily, I never experienced that, but the ocean's very deep, which means the water is extraordinarily clear as well. And we were at this one island, which apparently had hammerheads. And you, what you would have to do is like the island's round and it's basically walls all around, except for one area that protrudes like a ridge. Like, so imagine like my lap is like a ridge. Yeah. So that ridge is at about 35 meters or so deep, but the water was so clear. The water visibility was like 50, 60 meters plus, like I dare say 80, like it was so clear. It was very deceiving because as soon as you got down to 30 meters which often feels deep and a little bit dark like you feel it you don't feel that you feel like you're at 10 meters yeah. like you feel like you're super shallow and there's this ridge and you know so like we are following the wall and then we start going to the edge of the ridge because that's apparently where the hammerheads hang out i've never seen them my my guests wanted to see them and then we get to the end we hang out for a bit and it's a bit deep we can't stay too long so we start coming back and then I look, and from one side, there was no current. And then from one side, I see this wall of bad visibility coming in, like like a sandstorm in the yeah. desert. And it just starts just, like, it's coming at us. And this ridge is coming up from, like, really deep. And how you know where the water is going to pull you down and pull you up is depending on how it hits a certain area. So it, like, hit the reef or the ridge and started to go over. But wherever it goes up, it'll find a way to go back down on the other side. And we were like on the edge of the ridge where I knew it would start to pull us down. And it did pull us down a little bit, like 40 something, 42, 43, like they were holding on. So where were you at this, but you're at 30 and it's pulling you right down to 40. We were like 30, 35 and yeah. then we got pulled down. Quickly, like in seconds or? Uh, like dramatically, but not like, not like, oh, I can't escape out of it. Like I'm going to have to fight really hard to get out did of you, it. Did you like, could you? You had to clear your ears quickly, like you could feel the pressure? At that depth, you don't have to clear your ears so it's much okay. because the pressure difference is like much less at a deep, at a deep, like the, it's the first 10 meters where it's the biggest issue. Yeah. So the biggest issue was just trying not to get pulled down. And uh, they were not, the, like one of them was a strong diver, but three of them were not. And so I went one by one. All we had to do was like, if you just, like the wall was here, the ridge was here. You, you just make it to the wall and it'll just drift you along sideways. But because it had to go over this ridge, it will go down the yeah. other side of the ridge. And so, yeah, I just one by one, like grabbed them, pulled them up, like, you know, brought them, brought them to the wall and just like fighting really hard mm -hmm. to do it. And I looked at my air, it had been 15 minutes and I was at like 80 bar, which means like you should surface, you know, but, uh, 
yeah. And, and what, when you when you got out of the water, did they realize what was happening? I don't think so. I, we didn't really talk about it at all. Like they did, they were just like, "That was a beautiful dive." I'm like, "Yeah, yeah." I'm like, "Fuck, That's like this is like, uh, this is totally what I was freaked out about." Like in Indonesia, and here it was. But it's like going skydiving, and then uh, after you, you know your your instructor, your your tandem diver didn't tell you that one of the strings didn't pull out, and <laughs> what just fucking happened? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, I mean, it like it wasn't really like you know I just did the best. Like when I saw the wall of bad visibility coming, I tried to like urge them to come quicker, but you know. They're high-end guests. You're not going to, like, force them and, like, pull them around. So yeah. just, like, guys, like, let's go this way. Oh, and you're getting sucked down. And then just, like, grabbed onto a rock. And, and you don't like want them to panic them. either, right? Like, exactly. Like, yeah. They, they don't. Now, where, where were these guests from? Uh, America. Oh, America. Okay. And England? I don't remember. Did you meet any, like, celebrities or int interesting guests in the Raja Ampot journeys? Uh, underwater a lot of photographers. A lot of underwater photographers. Yeah, which was really cool because I was still, like, just new from Kotao. So, like, the people I was, like, admiring in magazines and online, I was, like, getting to meet. Who are some of your, who are some of the underwater photographers that you admire? Um, like, now or, like, the ones I saw? Uh, so, uh, the, uh, like, yeah, then and, and now, like, who, who are... Right, so yeah. we, I met Greg LeCur on the boat, and I think he's one of the most amazing scuba diving photographers. Like, he's very good. Um, I, like, I don't even know how to explain it. Like, we all shoot the same subjects, but somehow he just makes it look so magical. He's really good with, uh, with, with like, uh, fish life, like, aquatic life of any kind. He's based out of the Mediterranean... So he gets clear water a lot, but he did very well. Like he won some awards with the images he shot on on the boat. Um, these days, like I'm obviously like into free diving photography. I do admire a lot of war photographers um, and portrait photographers. I love Joey L. He's uh, he's just like a famous um, portrait photographer on land. Um, Marcus Bleasdale is probably my favorite war photographer um, for underwater photography, like free diving. Uh, some of the best are definitely Mitch Brown. He's very good. Um, there's a guy named Sue Huatica, uh, Michael DK. He's incredible, like yeah, in very very like speechless work. Mm -hmm. um, Dan Legend, another amazing free diving photographer. So. Gosh, like, you know, you put me on and the, the spot. I don't no, know. The list goes, goes on and yeah. on. I mean, it's yeah. same if I was to ask you who are your skateboarding Yeah, you can just, right? just you go can totally, off on a tangent. Yeah, you can go off on a tangent. Yeah. yeah. So but what makes them, is there anything, I, I guess it's very subjective in the the world of art to say, like, what makes one photographer better than others? Is there anything, like, objective to that? Or is it just subjective based on what you're feeling? Well, like, it's so dependent on, like, some people are just really good with light. Some people are really good with posing. Some people are really good with editing. Some people are just very creative. And mm -hmm. um, I think the reason I like so many is because they all have something else to offer. Um, it's so easy to make things look generic and just kind of like blend in with everything else. Um, I love their consistency. I love their like dedication. And, uh, you know, they're putting stuff out all the time. And it always looks like their work. It's not just like, oh, I hope it looks nice in any way. It's like it has to look nice in my way. And they're just so consistent with that. And, uh, yeah, it just drives so, me. To so you could see, like, one of their photos and say, like, similar to, like, a painting. That's a Picasso. This is a Banksy. Banksy. You could see someone's photo and know that that's their art. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 100%. Mm -hmm. um, if, if they're developed enough, for yeah. sure. It takes years. But, yeah, you can definitely do that. So I, I understand on your side, you're, you're more considered like, uh, and I correct me if I'm wrong, like, would you classify yourself as an underwater photog photographer on wide lens portrait using eight to 18 millimeter lenses? Eight to 18. That's uh, interesting. Um, I was reading that, that you prefer uh, eight to 18, eight to 15, um, or so eight to 15 millimeter. So yeah, that's, that's one of my lenses, but, um, I, have like a 10 to 24 i have okay. a 16 millimeter i have a 30 millimeter 1.4 as well i mainly use the 10 to 24 um i am an underwater photographer for sure just like a i would say an underwater portrait photographer, portrait photographer yes yeah because I, I i as much as like i am very passionate about free diving like some of my work is not free diving and it's still underwater right so like yeah. more like conceptual like the thing i did with anna you know i, I yep. photographed anna in the pool 
that's not free diving, but it's right. like beautiful and so. Well, this is your. This is your. Pa- this is also what's gonna pay the bills, right? Yeah, but I mean, working with her was just yeah. a pleasure. So, like, yeah, I mean, that was a collaboration, and that was like awesome. But if if people need something, like, and they hire me, like, I'll do what they want, and I'll do it as best as I can. So yeah, I talked to Anna. I sent her a message yesterday about that and asked her. Uh, what I could ask you about that, and she kind of brought up a point. W- what was it? What is it like working with a model, uh, uh, whatever, an Instagram model? It could be any model when it's their first time involved in underwater photography. Not just the creative process, but the control. You know, being able to prepare them for that. Yeah, I think a lot of portrait photography, whether it's land or underwater, requires you to build rapport and create a connection with that person. Like I knew Anna for a few days before, and we had happened to actually like speak at a few dinners and at a few events and it was like i i approached her to do it because i just saw that she had a background in dancing so you know i kind of strategically wanted someone that was easier to to maneuver yeah maneuver because man yeah it's insane i barely said anything she was just like just working magic Mm -hmm. so in that's kind of like with anna i would say it was probably one of the most effortless like collaborations i've ever done because she was just doing her thing and I was just like just getting the right angles uh with with normal people um it it varies so much about their background and like their comfort level in the in the water I prefer to do it like if they don't have free diving experience I'd rather not take them to the ocean just because literally every time people are so humbled by how difficult it is like it looks effortless and graceful in the pictures but putting it all together like some of them I've never worn a mask, right? And then yeah. they put on a mask and they don't realize there might be a bit of salt like getting in their nose, like they don't realize the hair is going to get tangled. There are so many things like you don't foresee, like all you're thinking is, yeah, I'm going to dive down and get that shot. But then you're like, wait, but like I I'm not even comfortable floating around. I'm actually really tired. Like I can't catch my breath, you know. There's so many factors that people don't realize are there until they actually get in the water. So I really try and talk to the person first and figure out where they are at so that I can figure out what we can do. And then I create the idea from there because if we can go in the ocean, maybe they're like a water person. They've spent their whole life in the ocean, but they've not taken a free diving course. Like, all right, let's give it a try. You know, but if someone's like, no, like I live, I've never really, I'm scared of the water. I I want to go in a cave and, and take a photo. I'm like, no. Like, just straight up, I'm like, I'm sorry. Like, that's not going to work. It's too dangerous. Yeah, if you don't know how to maneuver in there, if anything, especially with currents coming and going. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah no way. Yeah, so that's that's a big part of it. Like, um, like uh, the girls I, I had met this month at Sri Penwa, like with Jay, it was just amazing. Like, they work a lot. They They make a lot of content all the time. So it was easy. It was it's not their first rodeo, especially on that yeah. on that type of. Uh, yeah, you even even in that experience, maybe they've done underwater photography before. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I think I- I- in the example of of this last month, I I think most of them it was their first time, but you could tell it just by the way we were communicating that you know they were just like totally on board and understood how it was working. Yeah. Okay, I wanted to pull up one of the pictures. You said it's already been two hours. Oh, so oh that's, damn! It goes like from one twenty to. Yeah, what, what happened? It that just goes like insane. that. Yeah. Um, okay, well, well, and see, we didn't even scratch the surface. Yeah. But uh, w- uh, we want to pull up his Instagram. Take a second as we pull it up. So the picture I, I want to pull up, um, it's the one I, I spoke to your friend Ploy yesterday. I asked her as well. Oh, yeah, hey, Ploy. give me give me some questions that uh, that I, I should ask, especially in terms of the creative process. And she was involved in this photo. And I thought this would be an interesting one to bring up because sure. it's free diving, it's underwater, but it's also managing multiple people at the same time for a certain shot you're looking for, which is a whole other dynamic. Yeah. So we'll, we'll, we'll pull that up in a second. I guess we can talk about it and then it'll come up. How, how did you decide for, for that photo, especially in terms of the, the creative side of it, and also talking about the process of managing that to make it work. Yeah, good question. Um, so it was a it was a group effort. That was not like my idea in a whole. Like it was not. I did not think of everything on my own. So Jay, the guy that that wanted me to come to Phuket, he uh, is Jay. It's uh, live, live rich, media. live rich media. So yeah. anyone out there, it's very famous account. I'm pretty sure he owns Earth Picks. No. 
or he's maybe he manages uh, it. I think I think he's affiliated. Affiliated. With yeah. Okay. Yeah, I I actually didn't ask him, so that's a good question. I'm not sure. Oh, okay. Uh, I thought I saw some sort of connection there. So Jay, you're work. Sorry, continue the story. You're working with Jay on this part of the project. So yeah, he had a vision, right? So he brought me in to help him with his vision, and he's so good at making viral stuff. Like he thinks big, and he really like executes it well. And that's I learned that from him a lot uh, this month. So with with that photo, it kind of evolved. Like the idea was to get four girls together. He wanted something with wetsuits and he wanted it to be like badass. And then my friend Carolyn, whose like name is uh, on Instagram is Beach Bunny CK. Mm -hmm. I've known her for a very long time. Mutual friend. She's the one that introduced me to him. She she brought up a photo as inspiration, actually a photo by Dan Legend, one of the photographers I'd mentioned, where a girl was riding on the back of two girls. And, uh, and we were like, oh, this is really cool. And we were just trying to figure out, like, okay, well, like, how do we kind of make it unique, you know, like, get inspired, but try not to, like, do the same thing. And it came down to, like, my part was finding who the right girl should be and where we should do it. And last month, the visibility, in, or it's still still this month, yeah. So for September, the visibility hasn't been the best. Was, was this shot in, in Phuket or in PP? In Phuket. In Phuket. Well... Like one of the islands around Phuket. Yeah. What's the, uh, your account again? Well, uh, actually, you know what we can do if you want to make it easier on you? We no, can just post-production throw the image here. No, no, I, I got it. It's because the internet was not working. Uh, now it's uh, I'm a hotspot in my phone. Uh, your account? Uh, tones of Blue. Tones of Blue. Yeah. That's what's good about good. podcasts. They're more raw, so it's not like... Uh, with an E. T. Not tons of Blue. Tones. T so, uh, oh, Tones. Yeah. 50 tons of 50 tons <laughs> of blue. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> Who's that? <laughs> Love that. <laughs> Maybe oh, I gotta got get it. in touch. It is. Yeah. So yeah, there, that one with the with the girl surfing. Yeah, so it's the one on the far right. Yeah. And this one it seems um it, would you say it's gone viral? I saw a lot of accounts picking it up and pushing this photo. Uh for my standard, yeah. Yeah. I would say so. Yeah. yeah like I mean, like for my account, it was amazing how well it did. I think can can we you can click on it or no? Oh, the middle camera died. Oh, we got a. Yeah. All right, no worries. That's you okay. Got so this one here, yeah, it's on the the right. So yeah, that would. I, I, oh, it looks like you're not that deep. What are you? You're about two meters there. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 It's not that deep. No. Yeah. No. I mean, there's no point. So like. Um, so yeah, just to go back, like I had to find the right island. The visibility wasn't that good, so I was studying like the nautical maps, like seeing like where the deepest mm -hmm. water was, like where I could get some clarity. Uh, go up, and yeah. then on the third one on the right. Yeah, and uh, so I was I was trying to get some like clear water and somewhere beautiful, and and I'd found this island once before, like on the way to PP, pee -pee, and I was like, whoa, this is super cool. But we were going to pee, pee so I didn't really have time to. Is it one of those little rocks on the right on the way to? There's, there's yeah, a couple was, really small ones. One of those. They're little not rocks. even. They're not even islands. They're, yeah, they're base. It's a rock. Basically, yeah. yeah, yeah. So it was. It was just like, it was in the strategically a very good place. Yeah. So, you know, we decided to give it a try, and it was exactly what it what I hoped for. It was just very clear water, and we chose, like, ploy is the on the. Ploy is amazing, by the way, like super cool diver, really nice, really nice girl, great friend. She, we've worked together a lot. So I like it was really nice to have her in this photo because we already know each other quite well. Um, the girl on the top, uh, Christy, Christy Chan, I photographed her the week before. So we had worked together like because there was a lot of a lot of girls. Right. So like I was just trying to like we needed yeah, to find. We'll, we'll explain why there was a lot but in a second. <laughs> but like these girls now, I believe they're. Because uh, I, I was trying to 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 understand who this was, I think they're now they're all with with Jay yeah. in Turkey, right? That's right. And yeah. and then I think Zoe is uh, with. I saw because I was watching it today. I was watching. Uh, I think I think maybe uh, Jay's uh, Instagram, and they were like skydiving out of a balloon. Yeah, that that, that's her boyfriend. Brand that's her boyfriend, Brandon. Brandon. Okay, same I saw name that. As you. Yeah. I saw that. I'm like, that is absolutely like yeah. insane. Yeah, they're they're super cool. Yeah, so yeah. so she grew up in Hawaii, and so she's like she's like super super good in the water. Like from the first day, I came, I photographed her, and and it just worked out. In that bottom right, the 
the to the right one over no up up, up that yeah. that one this yeah cave. so that's zoe and that was the first day i came to is this i would assume that's pp then no 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 really no oh, but okay. it is like one of the limestone oh okay um, okay yeah i mean uh, honestly like i would say like there's probably so many places like this around phuket that just i don't know i i if they haven't been explored like people need to get slapped because they're, 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 they're hard to get you need your own private boat though yeah i mean lot of if you're diving and you don't know where they are like just look closer because they're all there <laughs> you know what i mean like may maybe not slapped but like <laughs> but but definitely just look a little bit closer because they're all there um they, it's a very beautiful place like uh, I, 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 there's so many places I have that I want to see that I haven't been to yet. But going back to the other picture. Yeah, let's go back um, to the, I just trying to, it's more understanding, not just the creative process, but the ability to capture that because right. that would be the timing, the, oh, the framing is this probably, how long did the, how many shots did you, are you doing like, uh, is it taking like what? A hundred, uh, 30 frames or 30 shots a second. Like, how are you able to capture this? Uh, I don't like to use burst mode, actually. I don't use burst mode. I okay. just kind of just click the shutter. Yeah, my, my camera can work quite quick. Actually, I was using Ploy's camera. My camera broke, so I'm actually using a Nikon Z6. And, uh, yeah, so Ploy, thank you once again for yeah. helping me with that. Um, so we actually made a video of this first. So Jay wanted a video, so we recorded a video of this. And uh, they're surfing. You can check it out on his account. And then, and then after we made the video, and that took more time, I think, because obviously the video is a moving picture. Like with a photo, you could get away with just like a, you know, yeah. just a quick moment. Everything looks right for that one second. But that was kind of the rehearsal, right? So doing the video over and over, we were kind of moving around as the light was moving. I kind of specifically wanted them to be like near a shadow and just to kind of give it a cool vibe. And and then and then we, we got the video quite good and uh, I decided like, okay, well, like time for me to do what I usually do, like like take a photo. Um, and they, I think this was like five or six tries. It blew my mind because I told all of them like the day before, I'm like, prepare to work really hard. Like my experience is two people in a photo is a mess. Yeah. Like three people is like near impossible. And then four is like, don't even bother. But somehow, like they're they, like we we chose the right girls, we chose the right place, and they were all amazing. Like uh, we got Carolyn Beach Bunny and uh, Ploy on the bottom, and then Krista, uh, Christy, and uh, Zoe on top, and they just they look amazing. Like Jay made sure they were all had like the same wetsuits, the same vibe. Like uh, I think they all went to True Dive to uh, pick up the the dive space with with True Dive wetsuits, and it's like. They all got those like sexy, like, um, you know, the kind of like, no, like the legs are exposed, but like mm. the upper body. So there's so much thematics and like um, thought that went into what they were wearing. We had discussed the position before and uh, and yeah, I was a little bit worried when I started shooting. And then I like after the first dive, I looked at the back of my camera and it's like, all the stress that I've been feeling like leading up to the shoot just like immediately disappeared because I could tell we were going to get it right away. And I was because like, you got oh. it so quick on the on the fifth try. Yeah. There must be a lot of pressure and stress based on the weather changing, meaning right now it's perfect, but oh, man. we don't know what's going to happen in 10 minutes. Oh, man. Does a cloud it's, come over? Does a storm roll through? This is the bane of my existence, dude. Yeah. It's, it's, it's nuts. Yeah, so... It just all worked out that day. I was like so grateful because we we did have some like stormy days leading up to it, you know. And then Jay wanted it done same day, so I, I got back. Like that was a long day. We we went out at seven a.m. and we got back at like like after dark, I think. And then it was like I was like like ten Completely twelve gassed. hours, and then he's like I'm he's like I want this video out, and I'm like shit, uh, like I'm going to my room. I'm gonna edit this right away, and I was like. Just like had dinner and like stayed up till 2 a.m. editing it. And then I showed that one to Jay and he's like, oh, like I like another frame better. And I edited the one he chose in the morning. Yeah. And so each edit takes like that one was like three or four hours. Just for that photos edit. Yeah. Mm. And then so in the morning he wanted another one. So I'm like, OK, like fine. Like, dude, you're the boss, like whatever you want. And I showed him the other one. He's like, no, I like yours better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but so, some, sometimes you yeah. need that variety to make a decision. Totally. Right? You need to yeah. compare, uh, you know, apples to apples. Oh, I, I totally respect him. Like, he pushed me so much in, like, the best way. And, like, uh, 
yeah that's that that's totally like what you need you, you, you like i like to have um a proof what's it called but like to, just so you're, you're you're you have something to compare it against like for example like uh i don't know if I, I read this coming from you or i was watching a lot of youtube just to be a little bit more prepared for the conversation have the right questions but it's someone was saying like it's better to take 10,000 photos and choose one than to take 10 or 100 or 1,000. The more you take, the more options, and then you're going to choose the right one. Yeah, it, it, although, like, um, it's funny because, like, if you have, like, a roll of film and you have 36 pictures, you'll have one or two good ones. Like, if you have, like, 1,000 photos on your on your, um, on your your memory card, like, you're going to have one or two good ones. You have 10,000, you're going to have one or two good ones. Like, it, it's yeah. the psychology of when you choose it. Like, you'll like something from one photo and you think this is the best one. Then the other one has something better, but it doesn't have the thing you originally liked. So then you start finding one that has both of them. And it's it's like a never-ending process of, um, li like, selection is so important. And um, and it's, it's better to shoot more, like, in my experience, because moments are really gooey like you know the right moment like it looks like in a picture it's like frozen forever but like when it's happening it's messy man like things are like moving people are floating like it's yeah. not easy to stay down like to make it look like you're streamlined or dynamic or standing on the ground you're like you want to breathe you know like yeah the cloud comes over and everything changes maybe when the cloud comes over it's what makes the shot mm -hmm. and then like you only have two frames because you're upset because there was a cloud and then you realize no the cloud actually makes the light way cooler you never know so like the most important thing like with what you're saying is like the way i look at it is like do not get fixed on one idea just like shoot with an open mind like don't just don't just try and be like i have this vision and i'm only going to shoot this one way like shoot your vision, then find another vision, shoot that, then find another one, shoot that. And sometimes, like, the thing that you thought was, like, the, the worst idea ends up being the best one. Mm -hmm. It's really weird how it works. And, like, you should never trust your opinion in the moment, in my, in, like, yeah. for myself anyways. Like, I'll, I've been so confident many times in being, like, that's the one. I look at the back of the camera, I'm like, this is the shot. And I go home, I'm like, no, actually, that's the shot. And, like, in the camera, yeah, I just, like, skimmed you're, you're, over the, it. The LCD screen at that point, it's so small. It, it, until you get this, you know, on on your monitor and you can see, you know, all the colors and what's going on there, it must be very difficult to make a decision from, you know, this sm small standard. It changes everything, yeah. Like, um, the size of your screen. Yeah. Uh, everything like that, it, it really changes um, your perspective and sometimes there's little details like sometimes it's the little things that you don't see that when it's brought up you're like whoa this really makes the shot like is there some uh do you want to show us something from your instagram uh, account um, an image that you're most proud of uh sure it's probably not like the best performing one but if you scroll down more or less like the story behind it of like of that process and, and maybe what you've went through to, to capture that. Yeah, so to actually to tie in to exactly what we're talking about now, if you scroll a, a little bit of ways down, you'll see it, it's a, there it is, the up, the bottom right with the red red swimsuit. This there one? it is, yeah. Okay. So that's ploy again. Yep. And uh, this is a boat that's capsized, so it's actually upside down, and she's sitting upside down on it. So... And, and where, where is this exactly? So this is in Koh Tao. So, like, just to talk about, what, like, to tie into what we were saying about, like, um, shooting many photos and not getting fixated on one idea. We went out that day to shoot in some caves. And it just was, like, a cloudy day and it wasn't working for us at all. And mm. we, I had just gone back to Koh Tao that morning on the night boat. And she had just been working, like, so long. We were really tired. But we wanted to shoot together because she was leaving. And it just wasn't working out. Like, we went to the spots we wanted to go to. The water wasn't clear. Like, nothing was going in our favor. And, like, both of us weren't, like, really... We kind of, like, lost the spirit a bit. And we were swimming back. And I'm like, let's go dive under some fishing boats and see if we can get some co something cool, like, under these fishing boats. And then we did that for, like, 30 minutes, and it didn't really work out. And then we started swimming back, and I could see just, like, the tip of a boat like bobbing like it you, you don't really recognize like the tip of a boat that's upside down bobbing on a buoy like you just you just think past it like because mm. what the hell is that but i just kept looking at it like is that a capsized boat 
like, is that actually a capsized boat? And we swam over to it, and I'm like, oh, my God. Like, she was really tired. Like, her ears weren't working or her sinuses. I don't remember. I'm like, ploy, just like, can you give me five minutes here? Like, you know what I mean? Like, this is... uh this is special. Like, I don't think in my life I'll ever see it. Like, if a boat capsizes, it, like, often, like, sinks, I think. I don't really know. Like, I don't have much experience around sinking boats. But, like, it was just bobbing up and down on the surface uh, just like that. And uh, But this I, looks like it's it's upright, no? No, it's upside down. So really? can, you, can you flip it somehow? I should have done that. Oh, uh, okay. That it? is why we can't... Un- because so, she's upside down. So, yeah, the top yeah. is, like, the top of the image is, like, deeper. So she's actually sitting. So it's lost uh, on many people, and I think that's yeah, why, I like, it. that's why many people didn't really get, like, why this she's is. She's upside down underwater. Yeah. yeah, so her legs are sticking out onto the land. Got it. Oh, I can't. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, no, I, I, yeah. I get it, though, yeah. You'd have to screen capture it and, and bring it in yeah. Photoshop and flip it. Yeah. Don't worry about it. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, so, like. For for a number of nerdy reasons, I love it, but also for like the uniqueness of the moment and and recalling the fact that we were both extremely uninspired, mm. but no matter how we felt, it had no effect on the final result. Well, you saw the opportunity, and you didn't want like you got to grab those opportunities when they're there because oh yeah, might be gone, right? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't think I'll ever have that ever again. There's yeah. no other chance. And like thinking of the right pose, like how she's sitting, she's looking down, the lighting's coming from below, which is known as monster lighting, like in, in studio photography, it's like used for creepy, like telling scary stories, you know, you shine the light from under you. Yeah. And it kind of feels very ghost-like because she's like upside down and it's like a sinking ship and she's got this kind of somber like mood where she's looking down and, uh, and it's ghost lighting on top of that. So it's a bit nerdy with like the red and the blue complementary like colors kind of there. And it's balanced well. So, like, there's so much of it that worked out where the day I shot it, I just went home thinking, like, there was not really much. So I should have posted it right side up so you could see it. I don't know what I was thinking. That's a a good choice. You did a good choice. Yeah, Yeah, because then it it, when you know, it's a bit of an Easter egg as well. It's like people need to think twice of what they're looking at. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I think, like, with Instagram, like, you get someone's attention for, like, three seconds. So. So like the people that really um, like uh, like like my work, um, they they really went with it, but it didn't get featured that much, I think, because because of that. But I mean, on my account, it did really well. Like for me, like three thousand is is excellent. So I'm happy with that. Yeah, I mean, if uh, if you reposted in a story, one up and then one down. Yeah. But because yeah, honestly, when I looked at it there, I was I thought. She's out of the water. Yeah, 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 exactly. That's I, what I'm thinking. Yeah, it was like the illusion went yeah. too well. <laughs> yeah, no, really. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what really ended up happening. Yeah, so, but so this whole connection, uh, okay, it's okay, it's okay. You can close that because I find when you leave it open, I'll just stare at it the whole time. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> good call. Um, th- this whole connection that that you've had in um the past month, you've been staying down at Sherry Panwa. Um, how did that all come together? That was from your contact bunny that connected you with Jay. And then that, yeah, let's yeah. chat about that. That's nuts. Yeah. So I was in Samui, like just with my lawyer, like one afternoon and, um, like I had received a message from Jay, like beach bunny CK, like showed him my account because I photographed her four years ago. She's like the first person I photographed free diving, even though I was a scuba photographer at the time. And she showed him my account and he liked it. And he followed me and I followed him back and he's just like, he, he gave me like a quick compliment and that was like a year ago. And then like <laughs> out of nowhere, he like, I just woke up one morning and he's like, we're coming for you. Like, that's all he said. Yeah. He's like, we're coming for you. And I'm like, yeah, like, cool. Like when he just like, didn't answer me. Like he's a busy dude and I get it now. But at the time I'm just thinking like, what the hell is going on? <laughs> and I'm like, well, I got to go to Samui to see my lawyer. And I, I'm in Samui with my lawyer and it's just like, I get a call and it's like the manager from Sri Panwa, like, uh, and she's like, yeah, like I'm calling on behalf of like Kun Jay and Kun Dan. Like, you know, Kun is like Mr. Yeah, of like yeah. high formality. And I'm like, and then like my friend's like, yeah, I heard like Dan's with them as well. And I'm like, what the hell is going on? Right. Yeah. Like to me, I'm just like, and then for that Dan Blizzar- Blizzarian. Blizzarian. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so it was Dan and Jay and they've been friends for a while. And I guess they decided to meet up in Thailand. I didn't know this at the time, 
just I know Jay wanted me to come down and they called me from Sri Panwa saying like uh yeah can you come whenever you can like as soon as possible like the notice was they were already there at this point yeah and like so it's yeah. like get the hell over here yeah quick. they took a private jet from from yeah. Greece yeah and then they arrived and uh and I saw that and I'm like okay they're in Thailand and I knew that much but I didn't know like what to expect and then they're like get down as soon as possible Public transport was, like, not a thing last month. I don't even know if I can go back with public transport. Yeah, right how now. did you even get in here? Did I, you got, I got a private driver. From the, Took the ferry to Donsak, took the, and then yeah. took the... Yeah, I got a private, private driver. driver. Yeah, yeah and, then, uh, and then a letter from them just mm. giving me permission, like, giving me to a get reason. In. Yeah, yeah, and, like, all the tests and stuff. So I took a PCR test, and I came back from... Uh, then I came back from Samui and had to take a second PCR test. Like, the day I got back, I was, like, yeah. back in the hospital... Then well, let's not talk about that too much, because what will happen on YouTube? Oh, really? Right, yeah. right, right, right. Yeah. yeah okay. Okay. They, they, so, the YouTube algorithm is insane. Yeah, yeah. Like okay. That, that word right there, we might have okay. to bleep. Anyway, so, so that's fine. Le, le, can we, yeah. can we like just read? Can we? No, no. Let's just continue. That's that's not that's not, a, that's later, yeah. that's not okay, enough cool. to 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 block it. It's only certain words. Right. But anyways, right. continue. Cool. So. So anyways, I was just back on, and then I took a night boat and then met my driver in the morning and I was in Sri Panwa by like um, midday. And yeah, I, 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 I'd heard of Sri Panwa, but like when I walked in, I was like, where the hell yeah. am I? Like, this is insane. And they're like, yeah, so here's your room. And then I went to meet Jay and just, yeah, Jay's sitting by the table while uh, by the pool while all the girls are learning to scuba dive. And he's like, yeah, welcome. And you're just super nice. Like, everybody made me feel so welcome. Like, I guess, you know, like, I, I was obviously, like, quite nervous and didn't yeah. know what to expect. And they were all like, yeah, we, we like your work. And, and it just really made me feel welcome right away. So... And um, people need to understand, Siri Panama, it's no, it's, I mean, the rooms are minimum, what, 10,000 plus bought 15,000 bought a night. It's, yeah. It's one of the more expensive, if not one of the most expensive hotels on the island. It's legendary. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. crazy. Yeah. Like, um, the amount of it, the, the attention and detail like that, that there is in that place, like the, like from like the food, the garden, the rooms, like the yeah. pools, like the architecture, like I was just finding new places every day like until i left like there was like new parts of the the resort i didn't even know existed which were like very very like well made like you know what i mean like they put so much money and work and thought into them and they're just like so humbly like hidden mm -hmm. all over the place and it like oh, man i i don't even know it's one of like, the best the better hotels you've been to oh if i'm not the I've, best like the best for me like in thailand like i've not seen anything like that i didn't even know like i'm sure there are like some competitive ones, but like I, I honestly, for me, like the experience there, like I got a giant infection in my elbow, for example, mm. and like it just, yeah, I got stung by an urchin shooting Dan, Shit. and uh, and then it just like swelled up into this like little like like one of the black sea urchins with the, the yeah, yeah 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 I was just like really fixated on getting getting it getting the shot, Shit. and then uh, it wasn't a big deal, but it just like got infected and grew to be huge, and then like it had to be cut out. And, like, I couldn't stop diving, you know, but it was, like, a giant hole in my, my arm. And then and then they would, like, they knew that, and they would, like, bring me, like, all the stuff to my room to, like, clean it. Like, like the attention to detail that the staff have is, like, insane. Like, the fact that I didn't even tell them, and then, like, the room service would know, like, that I needed this. And yeah. just, like, start bringing, like, every day the specific waterproof band-aids that I needed. Like, like, little stuff like that that you would never imagine, like... You know, that's, like that's maybe your parents, or something. yeah, right. like, like for me, yeah, because usually, like, I'm just kind of like keep it more chill. But like, I was so honored, mm -hmm. and uh, and then they just made me feel super welcome, and it just made me want to work really hard and just make like the best possible. How how was that uh, working experience? Like, were you photog doing photography like pretty much every day underwater? Did you have time to kind of do some R and R, or like, what was your 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 scope of work um because again you told me you're there for a full month pretty yeah, much yeah yeah it was nuts 34 days i think it was like yeah. I, something like that um so it was it was very like um up to the day and like what the weather was like whatever because everybody also needed to make content on land so sometimes the places we would go to were not actually um like favorable for underwater so like on those days i might go diving with dan or 
I would go um, just to my room and edit, you know, like yeah. there's amazing experiences that I probably could have joined them for, but I kind of had to like keep ahead of my work because editing yeah. underwater photos, like I said, takes so long. So it's like I'm just sitting at the computer all day. Yeah, yeah and you got to get the content out quick. And oh, yeah, it has to be relevant. And yeah, yeah so I'm, I'm like used to being like a bit more like, oh, sit on it, like let it marinate. For and it's like, weeks. yeah, <laughs> but but no, like it was like, go, go, go. And um, and then and then I met Dan like a week into it and he he was diving he t he he was diving with ploy and then and then jay introduced us and we did some he he wanted dan to get some shots so i started diving with him and we just um connected like he really liked free diving he was just asking about it all the time like that's really all he wanted to do like even during the boat parties and stuff like when they were out on the yachts like me and him would just like go off on the speedboat and just go diving and like and like, yeah, he was saying like genuinely, like in the podcast, he told me in the water, he's like, this is like the best moment for me. Like, this is what I enjoy the most. Yeah, he's saying, I listened to the Mike Swick podcast with Dan and he was basically just saying like free diving mushrooms in the beach. That's, that's better than anything <laughs> money could buy. Yeah. And, and it is true in, so, in some sense, even, I mean, the way things are now, it's not so easy to get around, but some of the better times in Thailand don't cost money. Yeah. Yeah. Right? For me, like... Oh man, like yeah, it's it's usually like the crazy situations, like where you're going through like some crazy, crazy yeah. experience, or yeah, just like genuinely just finding yourself in the right place with the right experience, and like nobody really cares about the story of how you had like your best ever mojito on the beach no. on a sunny day. Like you tell that story to your friends, and they're gonna be like, "Okay," you know. But it's like I had a gun pointed to my face, like in Hanoi or something yeah. like that. And it's like, wait, what? And like, that's, that's the kind of like stories you remember. Mm -hmm. And, um, and yeah, so, but, but like, he's, he's really into nature. Like, uh, oh, one sec. is that okay? You can keep going. Yeah. Oh, we're on the okay. wide frame. Oh, and, and, and from, from that experience, you, you said, so Dan's really into the free diving. I, I told you off camera before I have my a Ida level two. Yeah. Um, I'll talk a bit about that, but I did that right when I moved to Phuket. Nice. Like literally the third day, Crazy. me and another guy moved here, and I'm just like, I'm gonna live here. I need to learn to free dive because the now I, I actually I didn't even I did my Ida before my scuba, and um, there's a lot of myths about free diving when you're when you're let's call it bro science. You know, yeah. I, I've been to the Philippines and you go snorkeling and you think you can get down to ten meters, and people tell you to. Uh, do um what's it called when you breathe really fast and then hyperventilate hyperventilate and you're like oh yeah that's how you get all the oxygen in you to free dive yeah i know and then immediately <laughs> i told my dive instructor he's like no you're gonna kill yourself yeah. so i i decided to take this and it was one of the most intense experiences of my life how, I, I, how so um in in the sense of getting because you have to get to 20 meters to get to level two so yeah. it took me like six tries because I had a cold on the I, same day, on the on the same day, like six try, like not six days, like you mean? No, no, six no, tries. six tries on the same day. Oh, that's impressive. That's yeah. really impressive. But like, because my I'm so competitive, and my buddy yeah. did it right away. I'm like, mother, and he's he's actually from Vancouver. Yeah, and I was like, you fucker. I'm like, I'm not giving yeah. up. But I, the problem was, I had a cold, yeah. so like I could not clear my ears around like meter twelve or ten. Mm -hmm. It was just so painful, brutal, dude. And yeah, I just you can't push it. I pushed. <laughs> <laughs> and like that was a terrible idea yeah of course well because i wouldn't tell the diver he's like you're good like, i'm like yeah yeah i'm good i'm just losing my breath anyways i got to 20 <laughs> and i've never been back i've never been back yeah, to that's, 20 that's called mental trauma dude <laughs> <laughs> <That's> <laughs> like you have no idea how painful it was i thought I my know, ears were gonna burst yeah. yeah and yeah i did it but from that experience and um learning the the techniques of, of how to you know how how to to free dive and initially initially get yourself down there now i'm comfortable at like i like five to ten yeah totally. that's it i'm not gonna if i free dive i'm not really even ten's pretty deep yeah it like gets enough and people don't realize like some people will go diving and they'll be like yeah I, how far did i just go down i'm like two meters they're like oh i was like seven i'm like no you went, right, <laughs> you went yeah. down like a meter and a half yeah of course so and it's um people people tend to like have a very distorted perception of, of the depth yeah. yes yeah 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 but it, it was a it, it's a great skill set to learn um now when you're diving with with dan what types of things was he asking you specifically to improve his skill was it more about technique 
Um, with Dan, it was like, in the beginning, he just wanted to know more information about diving, like the correct way to breathe and like what's physically possible. Like a lot like exactly how you explain yourself, right? Like you say you were competitive, though I know on his first day he did 21 meters like effortlessly with no with no ear problems at all, like yeah. Ploy told me. And then when we went diving, he preferred not to go on the line. He just likes fun diving, just like checking out the reefs and stuff. But, I mean, it was always in the back of his mind to hit 30, I think. Like, Holy he wanted shit. to hit 30, which he did in Dubai. Yeah. That's is, that's dude, he's he's super good. Like, in the end, he was doing, like, dives to 10, and he was staying two minutes. Yeah, that's... Yeah, after, like, a week. <laughs> it was yeah. insane. I, like, he really picked it up quick. Um, So, he was asking me, like... He also wanted to know about the extreme end of it, of course. Like, about, like, the blackout end and, like what happens in the deeper depths and, and just, you know, just trying to give them the straight info, you know? But there's a certain level, like, I wouldn't push past. Like, I, I again, I found 20 was enough. The guy that I went with, I think he went to Ida level four. Mm -hmm. uh, so he went down to 40. Yeah. And I told him, I said, dude, like, why are you, why, why you're not going to be an instructor. You're not a photographer. He's, oh, but man. he just wanted to push. It's so fun. And he, he popped his ear. Oh, well. And okay. he had a ringing in his ear for a year and a half. And I saw him every day. He's like, he, I thought he was going to lose his fucking mind. Yeah, but like the dude was not ready to go to 40. No. I'm sorry. No, I'm no. Sorry, he told like, me that. Yeah. He said that. He's like, why? He's like, I wish I never did. And he never, and he's never, I don't think he's ever went dive. He was traumatized from it. Yeah. I mean, I was just like, I, I love hitting 40, but like you got to hit 40 when you feel right. Like I, like I've done it a few, like. Like, I don't know how many times, like, I, Kotal kind of bottoms out around 44, and I've done that, and it's fine. I have to do 50 for my, like, the Ida level 4, well, like, I'm in Molchanov's, and Molchanov's is wave 3, is the same as Ida 4, and, and to be, I'm going to be a wave 3 instructor, but to do wave 3 instructor, you have to do 50 meters. Oh, shit. But Russia has that, no problem, like, Phuket has it, it's just I haven't been diving in a month, so I would not even go to 40 right now, because, like, even though I've done years of diving, like, free diving, like, you need to adapt, and, like, you need to normalize that, like, on a subconscious level, like, you know that it's a relaxation issue when you're coming back up, and you all of a sudden feel like you can hold your breath longer than you thought. Like, you go down, you're like, oh, I'm running out of air, and then you start coming back up, and you're like, you're not getting oh, those, like, uh, contractions. contractions. Yeah, or you just start to feel relaxed again on the way up. Because contractions will be contractions. Like, you get to the surface, like, all the way back up, no matter how deep you are. If you're relaxed, you'll have contractions, but they'll, they'll, they won't go away if you get shallow. But if you're not relaxed, deep, you'll start to feel almost like you're having contractions. And then as soon as you're coming back up, you realize they disappear and that's when you know you're just mentally not ready to go that deep like you need to relax more is it like training for a marathon in the sense that like okay yeah you can go to 40 but or someone could run a marathon let's say but maybe you should train for a couple of weeks before you go for it type of thing yeah if you're doing like a like a max dive like your personal best and you start getting deeper you probably want to build up to it like physically speaking, I think you can do it on any given day. It's more like mentally bringing yourself there. Like the more I dive, the more I realize it's just all about what's in your head. Mm. And so I do a lot of like mental preparation. If I'm going to go diving for myself, um, I have issues with relaxation. Like I have a big chest, like I can hold a lot of air. I can, I have strong legs. I can dive deep. I've never had equalization problems in my life. So that's never been my limiting factor. My limiting factor has been my relaxation. And when your relaxation falls apart, all those things that I have down fall apart too. Like it all goes out the window. So you need to keep, keep like, um, you need to have like, you need to be very in tune with how you're feeling. Your, and how your to, Sam Harris meditation, does that play a big part in this? Um, yeah, it makes it like, cause that's mindfulness meditation. So you're more like, just like more subtle feelings and emotions, like things that kind of come over you, whether for a second or not, you become more perceptive to them and they feel like they're amplified. And how to block that and keep that, that yeah. mo the, the monkey mind from chattering, you know, in the back. Yeah. Yeah. So you need to kind of shut off your rational thinking. Like, yeah. so that's really fun when you do it because then you're living truly in the moment. You're like in the real moment of life, like the past and the future does not exist. Mm -hmm. Which is, like, the real goal of meditation, I think, is just to, like, experience the moment for better or worse. Like, it's not about, like, being happy and calming down. Like, 
if you feel angry, like feel it, you know? And then like, as soon as you start to feel like a, a strong emotion, it tends to like lose its potency. Mm -hmm. So like the more you fixate on the emotion, the more it goes away. And the less you think about the emotion, the more you think of the repercussions of like why you start feeling that way. If you're angry and you start feeding fuel to the fire, you're just going to keep being angry. But mm -hmm. if you're not relaxed, like you just start thinking, okay, like oh, I'm, I'm going to black out when I get to the surface and it all falls apart. Instead of being like, this is how I feel right now. This is a feeling like I've been training for this. I'm super confident. Like this isn't like just some random shot in the dark. Like, you know, you've done like, five meters less like 20 times already you know like it, mm. there's no it's not a guessing game like it's not about adrenaline it's just about mentally like knowing that you're calm like like to, to sum it up like free diving is about like how you live your life and then the dive itself is just revealing to you the truth about whether you're actually doing it right or not mm -hmm. like are you have a good mental grip on yourself are you flexible are you fit can you hold your breath and relax for a long time? And the, do these variables all you take into consideration before going for like a PR? Yeah. Like, okay, I, I maybe I, I haven't been working out or eating well for the past, let's I, say a couple of weeks. I'm not ready for that. I wouldn't do it. Yeah, yeah. Like I would just go out and like, it, you know, the hardest thing is to do what you did not do. <laughs> no offense. Yeah, no, I know. No, no, no. But like, you know, every, like, when you got the depth, like, you want to hit it, right? You got 20 meters, your friend hit it, you want to hit it. I didn't want to redo it because there was no next day. So right. I'm just like, I'm not coming back out on this boat. This well, is if, finished. if yeah. you don't want to free dive again, then, yeah, then I get it. It's just that, like, the biggest, like, when all accidents happen is when, like, you're just, like, the ego takes over, right? right. And, like, the com competitive nature of, like, you, you usually competing against yourself yeah and like that takes over and you're like i don't want to go home feeling this way today but the truth is like the greatest challenge is to be like this is not the time that is the hardest thing to because it could have went a really bad way as well i could have yeah. busted my eardrum or i don't think like yeah i mean to 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 like for your friend to rupture the eardrum well, he, he didn't, he doesn't know if it was a full rupture. What he had was a ringing that would not leave yeah, his, for a year and a half. tinnitus. Yeah, for a year and a, a half. tinnitus? I don't know how to pronounce oh, it. Man, I used to see him and he would just like, he had this look in his eye like, he's going to one off that himself. Sucks. That really Imagine sucks. Imagine, oh, anyways, it, it went away, but. Yeah, so that could have been an inner ear barrel trauma, like, but no, because inner ear is like to do with balance. Yeah. I'm not sure what happened because a perforated eardrum as well doesn't take that long to heal. So, like, you could be diving within a few weeks, I think. I've heard of somebody diving within four days of, like, perforating their eardrum. Do you have any, like, uh, I don't want to say scary experience or something that was, you know, a little bit more edgy from from one of your, your diving experiences yeah. that might have uh, made uh, you think twice, do I want to do this ever uh, again? Sadly, no. That's it's it kind of boring to say, like, like every day, the first day, like, the first dives for warm-up, I'll go down in 15 meters and I'll stay, like, one or two minutes. And when you're down there staying one or two minutes, it's the first dive of the day. You always think like, why do I do this? Like, mm. I hate it. Like this feeling because like the relaxation's falling apart. Like you're not warmed up. Your body's just kind of getting attuned to the water. It takes a few dives for me. Like some people can do it without warming up, but that's not me. What, what is your, t your technique? Do you use Wim Hof? Um, no, that's hyperventilation. Yeah, so, that's why yeah, I never. Yeah. Some people say Wim Hof, but I, I no. thought, why would anyone use that for diving? No, it hell no. Make sense. <laughs> what I <laughs> what idea. I use, and I can't. I don't know because again, I did this five years ago. The the technique, basically, what I do is, I I do a I clear my whole body probably four or five times, and then when I go for it, I like kind of s t push the stomach out as much as I can, take as much here, take as much here take here and then i do my duck dive that's yeah. this technique i i was using so so like in the Molchanov system and how most professional freedivers do it like the final breath you explain perfectly so like how you fill yourself up from from the stomach up yeah. like it, you that's exactly how you do it um leading up to it using any energy is not worth it because your body's already at full oxygen saturation like right now you're sitting with jam-packed with as much oxygen as you possibly can be like breathing anymore is not going to do that it's not going to help you have more oxygen. The only thing it's going to do is remove carbon dioxide mm. from your body. So By like expelling everything out. Yeah. So for those that don't know, carbon dioxide is built up when, when you, when you use energy. So when you use energy in your body to do anything, you need oxygen and sugar. And then the byproduct is CO2. 
And the feeling you get that you want you want to breathe happens from a lot of CO2. It doesn't happen from low oxygen. Mm. So by using any additional energy, such as taking very deep, heavy breaths, you are just raising your heart rate and then you're purging out CO2. And like you would think you would think that having less CO2 is better, but it's kind of like having like a fuel gauge on your car. Like if you don't have the CO2 to tell you you need to breathe, like that is a very important evolutionary like trait. (laughs) You know, I'm sure like if there was any like animal that evolved to not know when they needed to breathe, like they would die off pretty damn quick. And I'm like, we need to have that very intense response. So the best thing you can do is just keep your O2 saturation as it always is. And just do everything you can to slow down your heart rate and just use less and less energy. So mentally, just bring yourself in the moment and just physically just breathing like very calmly, like the way you are right now. Mm. And okay, so it. yeah, that, that technique of releasing everything and kind of dumping it out is... That's it, hyperventilation. It, well, in not, not way. like the... But more just a... What I'll do is I, I try to bring everything in and then out. And I do that like five times. So, but you're, what you're saying, it's much better just to kind of get calm, relax, and then you go for your big breath. And you just take one final breath yeah, and you okay. go. Um, in beginner courses, we allow three of the breaths that you spoke about, and then in the intermediate, two, yeah. and wave three, one, and then finally, as an instructor, you should do none. But I just encourage people to do none right away. But, like, by all means, do it. It's it's fine. Um, but, but yeah, um, the, the deep breaths, like, basically, if you breathe any more liters of air per minute than you normally would, it's hyperventilation because it means you're over breathing. It's all it means. Like if you're running and you have to breathe more, that's not hyperventilation. Your body is just telling, it's like telling you there's more oxygen required. So like breathe more. But if you're, if you don't need to breathe more and you breathe more, that's hyperventilation. So getting that out, like getting out of that habit is the best, which in, in turn at first might feel worse because you're going to feel like the urge to breathe right away. But like, that's a sensation that like gets dulled pretty quick if you dive a lot, you won't even think about it. And, and like, it, it's just like, it feels like a disadvantage, but if you were to do it for a very yeah. short time, you wouldn't even think about it. It's just like one of those non issues that beginners worry about. Are, are there any, uh, like, like your top number one or, t- or top two do's and don'ts or myths of free diving that people might have a myth misconception about? Um, yeah, I think like most people think like it's some kind of adrenaline rush. You know, that's like the biggest misconception. It's like you are only supposed to do what your body is comfortable to do. Like doing any more than that will give you like a f- like you will freak out. And that's not the point that like like anything in life, too much of it is bad. So free diving is not about going to these incredible depths. It's just literally about being relaxed and listening to your body and really like the truth comes out about who you are as a person, like how relaxed you can be, Mm -hmm. how like, um, like from the physical to the mental, um, it all displays itself as soon as you dive underwater. Um, it's very, and it's showing, is it, is it showing, uh, reflecting the current state of mind in which you're in as well? Meaning if you're going down and you're not relaxed, then mentally you're probably, yeah, uh, it's kind of like mushrooms again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so like, so basically everything is exaggerated. Like yeah. if you're feeling relaxed, you will fall into the most blissful relaxation you've ever felt. Like mm. I will tell you that like I can think of, like I'm trying to think of someone who did not like free diving after trying it. Like I Like maybe one person who just like was never in the ocean before that I've seen like over hundreds of students was like, no. Like, this isn't for me. But most people, like, even people that, like, have, like, issues dealing with anxiety and stress, like, they often are the ones that actually are the best at it because they're, like, the most in tune with these, like, terrible sensations. Mm -hmm. And then the more they're kind of, like, appreciative as they pass. And um, and then they realize, like, well, this is, like, a way I can work on it, you know? And, And it's really interesting. Like everyone, whether they have experience in the water or not, they go on the line or like they'll, everyone is always surprised at how long they can hold their breath. Like a hundred percent of people, even if they don't like free diving, if you just teach them how to do it, like they're always like, I can't believe I held my breath that long. Yeah. And it's, especially when you're diving down, you, you kind of stop to forget about the time because you're more focused on a task at hand instead of the time itself. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Unless you're doing the static 
discipline where you're uh, just lying in the pool. On the pool. I think I got up to maybe four minutes. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah that's really before. good for, for like when I was le- when I was learning. But again, it's people static, meaning you're not using any oxygen at all in terms of your body, your muscles, because you're so yeah, you're yeah, basically it, it does put your body into you stay in an aerobic state. So like yeah. you're constantly burning oxygen, but if you go deep, you actually enter anaerobic. Mm. So kind of like the gym. So you start to feel lactic very early. And if you feel lactic acid, that's actually a good sign. It means your body is preserving the oxygen rather than, than burning the oxygen. Is there a, fe- uh, is there a feeling behind feeling uh, anabolic or... or anaerobic? An- sorry, anaerobic. I'm thinking steroids here, yeah. <laughs> uh, is there a feeling w- w- that you can actually feel in your body, a sensation? Lactic acid. You can feel that. Though. Yeah, yeah, the oh, burn. Really? Yeah, you're coming up like... It usually is about 30 meters. People start to feel it because also you know, the blood rushes to your core. So like to protect the organs. Yeah, to protect it, like like just to reserve like the oxygen for like the most vital parts of your body. So your arms and legs don't have any oxygen in them, and when you start when you start kicking up, you uh, you start to feel the lactic much more if you don't have good lactic tolerance. Even if it's just like no weight, right? You're just like kicking up, and what you weigh like like what like thirty kilos underwater or something. Like I don't know how much. I'm just making up a random number, but it's nothing. And you start to feel lactic, and you're like, what the hell? Like, mm. I shouldn't. But it's actually a good sign. Um, and b- before we wrap it up, because we're probably getting three hours now, right? Oh, damn, yeah, it's one already. Yeah. Um, <laughs> just a, a couple questions, and it's more for anyone that is, is, will listen to this or, or watching this. Um, what, what's your best advice of people looking to get into underwater photography? Learn on land first. <laughs> Learn on land first. For sure. Like, it, it doesn't mean you, you have to, like, like uh, stay away from shooting underwater but like if you really want to progress like just learn on land first like imagine me like doing this podcast with you while floating in the water yeah it's you know like i just don't understand why people assume like um they um the only reason that people skip the land part and jump straight into underwater photography is that there's no danger in doing it wrong you know like you wouldn't go free diving without being taught how to do it first because you know there are repercussions if you're doing it wrong by yourself but like you can go out with a camera by yourself and like you get good shots or you don't and you go home and you're like oh okay well, like it worked out how it worked out but there's so much extra stimulus and distractions in the water and you're like the water around your body currents you have to breathe you're kicking you're using energy like your brain has ram right like there's a certain amount of ram in your mind and like that's dedicated to just surviving in the water. So and there's a lot of like, theory you need. You should start to learn before you just dive right in there. Just like basic photography yeah. theory, yeah. you know, um, like scuba photography helps like having scuba diving because then you can stay under for a long time and learn better. You can fix the mistakes rather than having to come back up, look at it, dive back down and shoot again. So if you're going to do free diving photography, um sh- learning on land first like learning in in safe environments like i know it's tempting to go to like the cool spots and like the caves and whatever yeah. but like some people need to be really careful like you're going to damage yourself your equipment and the environment you know um so that as well just like find inspirations people that you know that you think uh inspire you and just literally listen to your heart when you do it like if you're just doing something cuz it's it seems cool based on an opinion like you're just yeah. gonna fail that's not gonna work yeah you make make sure you, you have a passion behind it and you actually want to do it as well yeah, yeah so don't just dive in and cause you, who knows i mean if you if you if you're not comfortable free diving i mean how are you going to be an underwater photographer you, you need to have a hell certain, no yeah, yeah it's impossible right you could do scuba you know that's another option or you could do pool photography but like there's so many un- uh, unexplored avenues as well with the water. It's still like relatively new. Like the technical technological age has made all this possible. Yeah. So there's still a lot of room for growth, like in scuba and freediving photography. It's very exciting. Well, I'm sure there's even the cameras themselves to be able to handle that pressure and go that depth. I mean, I'm assuming the technology that's affordable probably didn't exist 20 years ago. Yeah, so, like, I'm just using a regular camera and a housing, but, yeah, the housings have been around for a long time. Uh, actually, the housings haven't changed so much, actually. It's more so the but digital there's, there's no issue technology. on, like, the lenses in terms of the, pr- the water pressure no. of it cracking or anything no. like that? Not at all. No. Um, is it? Let me see for a sec here. It's not. No, 
No, not at all. Like, it's about, like, how strong the housing is. Uh, the air inside, in theory, does compress. Um, like, inside the camera, like, the electronics, yeah. like, there w- yeah. there'd be compression on that, no? I'm just wondering if it's pressurized or... No, um, because, like, the container doesn't change size, so it's just about the strength of the container. Now, whether the air compresses within this or not, for some reason right now, I can't really... Um, Does the housing allow you to use manual focus? You can get an extension. So, like, on, like, uh, you would need to get a special gear. It's called a gear in yeah. underwater photography, which slides onto the focus ring. Okay. And then you would get a special attachment onto the lens port. So, the port is the part of the housing that is the right size for so the lens. you can then. Okay. Yeah, and then, but it's usually used for macro because underwater photography for wide angle is all... Or uh, yeah, like uh, like underwater portrait photography is all super wide angle, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so you don't really need manual focus unless you're shooting macro, like close up little stuff. I get it. Okay. Yeah, and these days with like uh, with the focus technology, it's, it's not pretty like sharp. A, yeah. Yeah. So, but you usually have a zoom gear, not a focus gear. Like so. But the zoom gear, f- okay, from the lens. But same same idea, right? So you have the two rings, the focus and the zoom. Yeah. And then you would just put the gear over the zoom, and then. And then there's like teeth. It's like a gear inside. Ah, the ring. Okay. And then they like they kind of like align in a from small ring. rig, like the small rig uh, rings you have. Exactly. Like, yeah, but you can use it in the housing. Exactly. Oh, okay. Just like in like a clock or something All like right. that. So that's how you zoom in and out. Well, like I like right now the lens I use, I, I don't even have that. So I just like set it and then just go in the water with it for Ready the day. Ready to go. Okay. Yeah, I don't really care because I I know what length I want. But if you want to play around, you can. And that's another piece of advice for photographers is, like, do not mess around with a bunch of lenses, like, all in one day. Like, use one lens for one day or a week or a month and then move on to the next one. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to, like, mentally register, like, what the difference is. You're just like, oh, I'm too close. Like, I'll zoom in. It's like, no, that's not. There's a reason wide angle is wide. Like, you want to zoom in, you zoom in for, like, a specific reason. So you're using these, like, fixed lenses, essentially. Well, I'm using a zoom lens like a fixed lens because yeah. I can't change it. I mean, I just upgraded to an A7R4. It just yep. arrived, and uh, I don't have any lenses for it yet, but I've decided on the 14 to 24 2.8, and I'm going to get the the zoom gear for that. But I don't know what these are. These are Well, these are the A7 Mark a seven Mach three. three. This oh, is A7 three. Three. Yeah, well, three. What's the, the lens? Is the aperture is 2.8? 1.8. 1.8. Yeah, so 1.8. so on fixed lenses. They're all 35. Yeah, so. I love 35 for land. That's like what I shoot. Well, we had to buy all the same because like we had like one was a 4.8 aperture, one was a 1.8, and then when you look at it later, like the flatness and the colors, everything is just changing. Yeah, and then every lens has like different like optics and different contrasts. So we just bought, or like, we'll just make them all the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the only way to do it. The one in the middle there. Is I no, think that's a wide lens. That's yeah. a 22, 2.8. Yeah, yeah, okay, there you for go. The, for the middle for the wide but These frame, two are right. the same. Yeah, but 35 is like amazing. Yeah. yeah, that's like my, I don't like anything. We have another 35. lens here. What's that one? We have a zoom lens, yeah. uh, the 18 to 105. 105. Oh, wow. Okay. 18 to so 105 the, lens. The aperture lens is, the aperture is probably not like so no, good. No, aperture yeah. is oh, fucked shit. Out. We were that using four. that one for the wide frame here, yeah. but the colors doesn't it was so look flat. that good. Yeah. It's too much of a compromise. Exactly. Yeah. It's like yeah. a 4.8, right? I think it's a 4.8. No, 4.0. 4.0. 4.0 yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so... Yeah, uh, no. it didn't. <laughs> I don't think I don't know what we'll use that for. I don't even know why we didn't know what uh, we were kind of doing too much. Uh, outdoor photography, uh, yeah, good yeah. portrait, and yeah. Yeah, you could like if you like, uh, like maybe zooming oh. in on products and stuff, yeah. With, yeah. like on the on the more telephoto end. And um, yeah. we'll we'll, we'll kind of wrap the, this up. I'm I'm so hungry. Yeah, dude. Yeah. <laughs> dude, no. Dude, um, um. Can can we do a plug for your um? Um, like any underwater photography schools and the ones you went to and how maybe someone could get in touch with those people? Yeah, so like I would say um, that, I mean, I'm I'm based out of Koh Tao at the moment, but I'm planning to move to Phuket. Yeah. So um, I'm well known for my photography, but I, I am an advanced freediving instructor as well. I teach the Molchanov system. Uh, and so get- you, you could teach people that like, are you planning to do that as well like teaching and absolutely yeah 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 i mean i love teaching i am i'm obsessed like i love having students i love seeing them progress i i love taking the time it it doesn't really feel like work um 
it's it's very pleasurable and a lot less stressful mm -hmm. than photography is actually because yeah. uh, you don't have to depend on the weather but um so at the moment i'm in kotao uh and uh i would say like aside from that like again ploy ploy and brandon uh, ploy scott she owns bangkok freedivers in um in Bangkok, and then now they're doing, I believe they're calling it Flow Inc. by Bangkok Freedivers. Okay. And that will be out of a, a boat lagoon in uh, in Phuket. And then you'll be connected with them as well, in a sense, or? Yeah, well, th well, they're very close friends. Like, okay. you know, they teach their own gotcha. stuff, but like, like we work together a lot, like doing photos and stuff. And We'll put, we'll put yeah. that in the show notes and we'll pop something, we'll pop up here or something like this. Yeah. And, um, then you, you'll plan to come back to Phuket. So if somebody is traveling here or, you know, maybe looking, you know, to, to get in touch with you, what's the best way um, that anyone can get in touch with you? And then you can just talk right to that camera, especially because I don't, I'm not sure, how, you know how Instagram it is. It's not so easy for yeah. people to connect because if you have a larger following to slip in those dms is no, not i I, I read them it's okay. i read them yeah if i don't yeah. answer you i'm sorry but it's probably because yeah. he doesn't want to <laughs> well do. if, if if it's just like hey give me money it's yeah, like, yeah. Right. <laughs> sorry dude yeah, I mean, yeah. i'm not like that yeah so yeah. um you can explain like how people can uh, connect with you and oh yeah you're just putting me on the spot like that i'm not i'm not really good at this stuff but i'll do my best but uh, okay. no yeah. it's just your i guess just your instagram handle or whatever or email however if they want to 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 be able to contact you for maybe uh, uh free diving lessons going yeah, out yeah. doing media anything like that okay cool so yeah. do, do i like start it by saying yeah whatever I'm, you I'm want tony yeah no okay. they know who <laughs> okay, okay so tell, they them they <laughs> tell them where they can i don't find know how you're gonna piece it together yeah. i gotta know okay don't worry we don't this is all raw we won't we don't uh there's not much post-production at all okay cool yeah. great okay so yeah i'm tones of blue i'm based in thailand currently in Koh Tao, but i will be moving to phuket if you want to reach out for photography or for free diving lessons, you are welcome to message me on social media under uh, Tones of Blue, tones.of.blue, or you can send me an email through my website. Um, I'll get back to you as soon as I'm available. And yep. yeah, that's it. Well, we'll, we'll connect and uh, uh, yeah, just you can contact them direct. But um, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure, especially with Phuket opening, and if you notice, Phuket's trying to turn into a like water tourism uh island if you're listening to the news especially the radio here this is the next plan for phuket they really want to push this into water tourism damn well yeah, I, like, I better move here right away then yeah especially yeah. like with the blue tree opening up and i think um a big part is going to be with the pangna airport opening up which is going to be oh, yeah. huge for the Samilian islands mm -hmm. like that's mm -hmm. so that's why they're opening up an airport there all the golf courses are opening up yeah, there yeah, they're yeah. trying to just so people from like Singapore can fly direct to Pangna or Malaysia instead of, you know, get to Phuket, drive two hours. Just make it yeah, a bit... to Kalak, right? Yeah, to yeah. Kalak. Yeah, it's gorgeous up there. Okay, that wraps up another episode. We are Fruiting Body Mushrooms. Um, uh, I never know how to end these things. So <laughs> uh, subscribe, like, you know, hit some bells, whistles. I mean, you, you better, better subscribe. All right, that's it. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Tony. Episode Yo, out. It's Cheers, a pleasure, buddy. man. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. Cheers. Cheers.